my noggin. There wasn't no cap on that Articus chest bone. Straight up like that, man. I mean, at some point, we're going to have to see clearly about this little ice age. Because it's all happening. It's all happening. <laughs> hey, welcome back to Press the John. Installment number 90. Let's go, man. I mean, we're excited to be where we at. You know, we've covered so many topics, uh, surf the wave so many waves, and we're just kind of hitting a cruising altitude, I'd say. You know, we haven't reached our peak altitude and nothing like that. We have taken it real easy, you know what I'm saying, to still be at Preston John number 90, and, you know, six years of recon right here, you know, on the on the tube. I mean, we've taken it real easy, man, and, you know. I feel good. I feel proud to be where we're at. And I'm proud of my wave surfers. I'm proud of Drop Nation. All my Naga support, man. All the contributors. The dragons on the wall. Everybody supporting 432 to Drop Radio, man. And, you know, all the entire Drop Nation. Tribe, tribe. The Shabbata. Man, all the tribe up music. Get the reconstruction pack. The press the pack, too. All that's dropping this week. So the my pack. Make sure you want it, man. And, you know, all my Nagas, man. You know, this is beautiful. You know, what I see, Nagas putting up a Nagaville flag, you know, asking a few questions. You know, are, are we taking things too literal or are we just talking tribe tribe? You know, you can't put us in a box and say, you know, you guys are just reading the pages off the, <laughs> the words off the pages and believing this and believing that. I think we've been asking a lot of questions in this Preston John investigation, like, where's the cat? on Antarctica's chest bone. That's a good place to start. Is that, is it, you know, my tripping? I don't see no ice. I don't see no ice, ice, baby. <laughs> no vanilla ice, man. So this is, uh, you know, 1575. 1575. We're hearing that the freeze over Started popping off right around, what, 1300s? Got colder and colder and colder. By the time they got here, Virginia, the 1600s, 1700s, I mean, it's a freeze over. It's an ice age. But there was no cap on Antarctica's chest bone in 1575. Let's check with the homie Perry Reese, man. The baffling Perry Reese map 1513 is showed in Antarctica centuries before discovery. <laughs> Hundreds of years before they discovered the ice wall. Here's a map of it, but without its ice cap, because there ain't no cap on Antarctica's chest bone. All you see is animals, you know, things happening, good stuff. <laughs> animals, you know, uh, they try to mark an elk devil. It, you know, the, you see um, stuff about devils, you know, on these maps. They try to put, you know, land of the devil. You know, they're talking dragon lands, man. They're talking Terra Fuego, right? What would be the devil to the hijack? Think about it. Think about it, man. You got to go see that movie, y'all. Uh, got, <laughs> I got to see it again. It's the Age of the Dragons or uh, Rain, Rain of Fire. Yeah, I think it's Rain of Fire. They they tell you their worst fears, like, yo, Armageddon, dragons are attacking Paris, dragons are attacking Times Square, dragons, dragons are popping all. Oh, that would be the devil to them. Fire-breathing dragons, man. Hijack ain't ain't afraid of nothing more than a fire breathing dragon, man. Watch Game of Thrones, man. But there was no cap on Antarctica's chest ball in 1575. Perry Reese map, 1513. Let's read about it. Late in 1929, Gustav Diesmann 
a German theologian, was working in Istanbul at the Top Copy Palace Library. While cataloging antique items, he found a gazelle skin parchment and a stack of discarded items. This parchment had a map drawn on it, and these men was amazed to see that it appeared to show the outline of South America. He rescued the parchment, which is now known as the Perry Reese map. The map he studied had been drawn and signed in 1513 by Turkish cartographer Hagai Ahmed Mohidin Perry, also known as Perry Reese. In addition to being a cartographer, Perry Reese served in the Turkish Navy, for which he held the rank of admiral. He stated that he had used 20 different maps and charts as his source documents. Eight of them were Ptolemaic maps, maps of the known world according to the second century Hellenistic or Greek society. Four were per Portuguese maps. One was an Arabic map and one was drawn by Christopher Colombo. This simple piece of preserved gazelle skin has been the basis of intense controversy in the world of cartography. For one thing, the map appears to show Antarctica almost 300 years before it was discovered. So it's showing Antarctica 300 years before it was discovered. Not only does it show Antarctica, but the continent is drawn as a landmass as it would have appeared before it was covered with this ice cap over 6,000 years ago. Con. Con, con. So not only does it show Antarctica, but the continent is drawn as a landmass as it would have appeared before it was covered with this ice cap quote unquote, 6,000 years ago. Are we just talking, you know, 200 years ago, you know? I mean, the hijack is exaggerating everything. And all you see is a continent popping off, a continent full of Nagas popping off. A whole continent full of Nagas. The controversy was precipitated when Professor Charles Hapgood published in 1965 his theory about Antarctica in the book Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. Professor Hapgood, based at the University of New Hampshire, had studied the Perry Reese map with his students and found several things that they could not explain. Not only was there an issue of Antarctica without its ice cap, but they noticed that the map was drawn using the Mercator projection, a methodology not used by European cartographers until the late 16th century. <laughs> Cuba already appears as an island, all right? Look, man. So we have uh, multiple witnesses in the 1500s that Antarctica ain't got no cap. When you go back to this Ptolemaeus Augusti, 1548, all this is 16th century maps. All right, I mean, let's just try to put some cartography together before we move forward, but not because we impressed the job number 90. And we're going to get back to talking about these ice walls, you know, but let's just focus right here at Terra de Fuego. You know what I mean? Now we done talked Tara Sancta, you know, Holy Land, you know, maps showing that Holy Land is existing beyond these barriers. They're talking Terra Fuego, which means they can't be talking no ice, man. Let's just, let's get it through our head bones, man. Let's make a decision. <laughs> as to what reality man we're going to accept man the the bull crap or we really gonna you know dig on it man you know we gotta we gotta make a choice terra de fuego don't sound like no land of ice 
Don't sound like no ice wall, right? We're talking about a late ice age, you know what I mean? And we're going to connect, you know, back to it, but, you know, just, or they call it little ice age, but could it be the ice age? It's more of a wave surfer type of question. Could we be talking about the big ice age? Happened in more recent, more dramatic, more drastic because you know when you have spells at hand you have freeze overs just like that i mean it's all happening but it wouldn't be called tierra de fuego come, come. now see how close this south america is see how close south america is to so-called antarctica right tierra de fuego just like it is over here on the Andre the Vet map, 1575. All right, this is the Chile, you know what I mean? South America. And here we go with Antarctica popping off. So why would there be such a drastic climate shift with lands damn near touching each other like this. You know what I'm saying? Why would the climate suddenly shift from fuego to freezing cold ice wall? You know what I'm saying? Like, this is just some type of magic that needs to be explained, you know? What does this all have to do with the Comsays comet and these media storms in 1833? You know what I mean? <laughs> what does it got to do with the fall of Israel. Did Hawa freeze certain areas over so that the hijack couldn't, you know, get to where, you know, they were trying to get to certain areas? You know, was it have, you know, anything to do with the harmonics cube that we've been talking about? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, these are things that we all got to, you know, Got to ask. I mean, we're talking glaciation, right? I mean, look at the time periods, right? 1785, 1905. Antarctica had no ice. Then Antarctica has ice. Then the Kumsay falls. You know what I'm saying? Like something's happening, you know? <laughs> They're setting up shop. Damn dams. But if you have glaciation lines, Monaga, that means you got ice sheets, man. Ice sheets all throughout, you know, this uh, Indianapolis territory. Really. It was almost like right outside of it, you know what I mean? Ohio, all that. Glaciation, man, glaciation. And last time we got that these moraines, moraines, they're also glaciation, but they're the rocks and sediments that's collected as these glaciers are retreating. You know, as it says down here in the legend, moraine, rocks and soil deposited by retreating glaciers. Glaciers, man. I'm talking America, man. Stop acting like I'm talking about something crazy. I'm not at... I'm not in the Middle East. I'm talking Morocco. I'm talking glaciers under Chicago, <laughs> Lake Michigan, Meshiokan, Meshiokan. You see the Meshe Moshe flow all over this place. You see them hijacking with harmonics going in a certain direction, right? At the same damn time as the Shikamaga Wars and these treaties is being put on us, right? I'm just like, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get a feel for what happened. We need to know what happened right around this time because, you know, it's a lot of sketchy history going on. A group of Nagas like us that's coming, you know what I'm saying, fresh about the soil, fresh about the mud, getting this drop, you know, we just popping off with these questions. Excuse us. Excuse the heck out of us, man. We here, though. We ain't trying to be there. We just want to be here. Now, can we be here without 
all this without this harmonics on us? Can we be here without it? Does here exist without it? Does India superior exist without this Morocco? Or are you just getting here in the third century? Moroccan Catholics? Do we, can we exist without Atlantis? Without the migration? The invasion? The glaciation? I'm just talking ice, ice, <laughs> baby, man. Hey, this is cray cray, right? I mean, this little ice age ain't no play play. It happened, man. And I think it's the big ice age, man. Why would they, <laughs> why, come on. Why wouldn't they call it the little ice age? They don't want you to, if this thing's responsible, for Antarctica freezing over, my naga, it's the big ice age, man. How can you call it little? How can you call it little? If there wasn't no cap on Antarctica's chest bone in 1575. How can you call it a little ice age? It appears, Monaga, that everything we've been taught, I mean, they, they call this Terra Fuego, right? How did it turn into Antarctica freeze over? <sighs> Some people say, man, maybe the ice don't even exist, <laughs> but I'm going to give them that. I'm going to say something happened here. You know, I'm going to assume there's ice. <laughs> I'm going to assume there's ice, man. But I'm going to also, you know, dig on these witnesses, these cartographers like Andre Tibet, you know, dig on this other, you know, witness over here with the Perry Reese drop. Where all we got is animals popping off, man. Life happening. Boats. <laughs> High level, you know, pop offness is going on around here, man. Ain't no ice, ice, baby. Ain't no cap on Antarctica's ice chest bones. So we got multiple witnesses, and it's more than this. I mean, you know, surfing the wave in the map pack, you're going to get all these drops, man. I mean, you know. <laughs> We got it up because we're going to have some fun in it today, man. We're going to be surfing the wave with these Preston John links and maps and, you know, just dig on some things, man. And again, Aqua Tracy led, man, make sure we was even more organized and, you know, focused in our investigation. So Aqua, salute to you. Shalom. All your great work in PDS will be on Preston Pack 2. So all my knockers has pre-ordered. You're already going to have it. And, it's a good thing you have it and you'll see why. So, I mean, strenuous work by the Aqua getting hundreds of PDFs for Naga. So, allow, uh, we'll be back in it. We're going to talk some things, man. I just, you know, we're just talking nice, man. We're just talking nice. So, it's something that you can't really say enough of because. If this is just another land that was just popping off, like popping off the way it looks like it was popping off. And they've done such a good job to isolate us from the life and the world that's beyond these pole points on this ball that we're spinning on suddenly. They've isolated, they've isolated us and have annihilated so much more than we can imagine. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, it's all being revealed right now. You know, our, our consciousness alone of uh, the cons is waking up these, you know, so-called frozen over areas. You know what I mean? We know Hawaii put us in a Ruach Tarni Mai. Maybe that's the spell that freezes everything over like this. That Ruach Tarni Mai, 
makes it ice cold, you know. But uh, this ain't no little ice age, man. Not if there was no ice <laughs> before. And if there ain't no ice here, how are you going to tell me there was ice before? If this is 1575, what, you going to show me a map of Antarctica in the year 900 AD with ice? What is this, a global melting? You know what, man? And shout out to the aqua. You know you are. Global warming ain't nothing but the end of the ice age, man. Where everything's coming back online, man. Coming back on top, man. You know, popping off again. Volcanic activity. Yeah, man. <laughs> Look. Global warming ain't nothing but the end of the ice age, y'all. That's deep. Climate change. Yeah. The Ruach Tardy Ma is wearing off. The spell is wearing off. Things are getting warmer where it should be warmer. Where there's more land for Anaga. More promised land. More Tarazanta. Tarazanta. You know what I'm saying? Tarazanta. We're just talking to the priest queens, the priest kings, the high Amazon queens, you know, Tarzan. So shout out to Perry Reese, man. And, you know, for us, you got to start somewhere, you know, so we're reconning, man, finding <laughs> how it all culminated and what this place probably really looked like. You know, before they tell you, oh, you from Africa, well, why couldn't you be from Antarctica? <laughs> why must you be from Africa? Are these Antarcticans from Africa? Come on, man. There's more land. This is just a peek at it. This is just a, a snippety snip of the more land, man. World's beyond the poles, man. We're gonna be on right, we're coming right in hot on the flat drop. I'm real excited about some, you know, new things to dig on, man. So, you know, buckle your boot bones. Hold on to your boot bones. You know, ask the question, you know, uh, <laughs> can we have India Superior without Morocco? And I guess not. I guess we can't have, guess we can't have nothing, you know, without Morocco, man. You know, Atlantis Islands. So when we have an issue with Atlantean hijack energy, hijack duality, phantoms of duplications, just know that there's, you know, there's family that's keeping it alive, right? Keeping this map alive, keeping this ham and Kush alive, doing it for ham, doing it for Kush, right? Ham and Kush, west of Maxim, northwest of Maxim. Everything is Morocco. It's all Atlantis. But where's Mu? What happened in the war with Atlantis and the people of Heva, the people of Mu, Lumeri. How does Mu connect to the cold? How do the ancient Nagas there connect to, you know, the ancient Nagas in India Superior, man? Did they come from Africa? <laughs> Well, now that we see what the perspective is behind the treaties, well, it's all there, you know. <laughs> you see Shem anywhere in this picture? Come on, Moab. I mean, you got to have Shem somewhere, Moab, you know. Shem got to be somewhere. No Jacob, no Israel. <laughs> but you want Jerusalem. You want the promised land. But that's just the land of ham. 
This is high level trickery on the on the worst level of trickery, man. Let's fall back. Let's let's you know again. I'm still thinking about this ice wall. It's all relative, because again, if if this is what the pitch is looking like, you know, everything for Morocco. And we see clearly what this is. Everything's Morocco anyway, you know. Who's the press to, you know, trying to uh you know, keep out of hijacking the Nagas in Nagavir. Who's the press to trying to keep out? Who's the press to fight against? Who's Joshua fighting? Who's David fighting? <laughs> Who's the press to fight, man? We're going to get back into the press of John Legend and sources. I, I'm just, you can't just have one side of the story and then say, all oh, this is, you know, for this and, you know, under this flag. And then, if it was truly about, you know, representing Morocco, man, you wouldn't have to make the treaties. You, you, you would just bang for Morocco. If this was truly your land, you wouldn't have to make treaties with the hijack and fight against people who, <laughs> you know, are fighting with all their heart for what they are inherent, have a heritage to, have, have an inherent heritage to, have a heritage. These Nagas got a heritage, they're fighting for it. You've been hijacking the heritage the whole time. You found Nagas that are inherently supposed to be here representing their heritage, man. <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to say, man, you know, these type of things haven't really been expressed in a long time, I mean, these type of thoughts on this type of level staring at, you know, <laughs> this type of shit right here, man. Because it has everything to do with you and me, man. It's nothing that we can just overlook and, you know, uh, not talk about. It has everything to do with the curse. Everything to do with the ice age, the plague, the famine. Yeah, man. The removal of our ancient love song. We got to talk treaties because they put treaties on the Prestors. They put treaties on the chiefs of Israel, the Hebrew cons. You can't be searching for Prestor and not understand what happened, how recent all this really is. I mean, 1200s is still recent enough, but when you really put it together, how this is all still rolling out, playing out in the 1600s, 1700s, and how Antarctica ain't got no ice. You got to look at yourself and say, man, who am I? Who am I? What happened? That this should happen to me and my people. That these lands are sunken that are no longer in remembrance, that there's a whole world I can't remember. This is why you can't remember your world, man. Look at it, man. You ain't even represented in their version <laughs> of your world. You, you don't exist. You just live in the land of ham. <laughs> I mean, I asked you before, man, does, does North America even exist? Not according to the Carta Marina Tavoli. <laughs> 
So South America just connects to China, Asia, India Superior. Then who are you calling hand when you're talking terrestrial paradise? Everybody want to be here, man, in Asia. Let's go. <laughs> All right. We're talking Terra Fuego, right? We got different maps of Terra Fuego. Different looks at Fuego. You see this Typus Orbis Terrarium map. And, you know, again, right under South America, Terra Fuego. And this is a good one because it shows you how long this ice wall stretch. Then it will wrap all the way around you. Now, South America is very interesting because it's so close to the ice wall. You know, they always depict it so close. Not even the ice wall. It's so close to Terra del Fuego, right? <laughs> the land of fire, right? Africa, you got to do some more, you know, navigating to get down there, but it's close at the tip. They always put stuff in the water, letting you know that maybe these, you know, areas are protected, you know, but... You know, maybe they couldn't get through certain waterways. You know, they got this piece of land over here, New Guinea, something like that. But Isle of Solomon, so Solomon Islands over here, okay. Because we about to talk some Philippine talk too, so this is all going to connect, man. But it looked like you could just kind of get through. I don't know if it, you know, that's one look at it. Another look from the Barry Lawrence Rutterman antique maps. Again, South America dang near touching Terra del Fuego. So everyone has this outlook of this Terra del Fuego. I want you to remember one thing, man, because we're just talking about these Nagas popping off. <laughs> Nagas is just popping off. Perry Reese's show you Nagas popping off. Everybody's showing you Nagas popping off, right? Nagas just popping off, right? Animals, everything's happening. Okay. Hey, shout out to the drop, drop, chatter, chat to chat, chatter. Hey, Copper Land is all the way up, man. We got that Nagaville flag popping off, man. Copper Land, what it do? Blue, purple, red, white, linen, gold, thread, loud, uh, love it, man. Yeah, we, we're going to talk some more gateways. I'm just talking a little Tara Santa right quick, but this is a perfect, you know, exactly. You know, we're going to be talking these gateways, man. Love to Nas confound it. Five eyes, what it do? Love to say cool. Who dropped this map now? We just saw those other maps. We're going to compare them a little bit with this. We're just talking to Preston. <laughs> We're talking Holy Land, which means we got to be talking Preston, right? We can't talk Preston John without talking Holy Land. So I'm just going through a little cartography, connecting it with a little, this more and more vibration, this temp, this, this Templar harmonic situation and this Ice Age situation. And when this ice really hit these lands, because again, it don't seem like there's no cap on Antarctica's chest ball. You got all these maps in the map pack. Antarctica, right? Very similar layout to what we see here. Oh boy. It's not, you know what I'm saying? It's not just some little speck that some map try to put some little Terry Day Fuego right here. Nah, it's an entire wall, man. Come on, man. You can't say this is a continent. You can't say this is a continent. It's more than that. It's a barrier. 
but it's a barrier of land. It's a barrier without ice, you know. It, it's or it's just. I mean, you know. It's like motherland, you know, it's like protected motherland in a sense, you know what I'm saying? Frozen over for protection, you know what I mean? But without that ice, who knows? And you're talking about a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of land, man. A lot of land. Now just pay close attention. Let's get it. Can we get it bigger than this, man? Okay. Same thing here, Antarctica, Pantagonians, all that touching South America, Terra de Fuego. Except you don't see Terra de Fuego, you see a whole lot of pop offness now. Uh oh. You don't see all that just nothingness, right? Nothingness. Nothing here, boss. Nothing. Someone is trying to tell us that there's more to it, right? <laughs> way more popping off, right? Now, just compare this with, you know, something like this, right? Okay. Where they're also telling you is way more popping off. Now, compare all this pop-offness. Naga's by the fire. Trumpets are blowing and trees and animals. Compare all this tear de fuego -ness. You still see that bright line you know that they like to draw like to draw that bright line all the way across except this bright line has maximum pop off and it's happening things are happening it's all happening boats everything's happening gotcha okay here you actually see the gateways, you know, where the water can get all the way through, where you can, you know, take a boat. And this is pretty, you know, these are pretty thick gateways. These aren't like little tiny. They got some tiny ones, but some are pretty big. You just navigate around, you know what I mean? <laughs> hey. So South America, you know, so-called South America, it's very very important spot because it leads you pretty much by land. You can take all the way to the areas you need to get to so you can get through, you know what I'm saying? So you can get through, you can't get through anywhere. So this is a very strategic spot. Now, when you go to the left, we saw this and we just start popping off right, right here. It says Tara Sancta. Tara Sancta means what? Tarsakta is a German word starting with the T here is the definition of Tarsakta in English. Tarsakta, Israel. Okay, yeah. And we've done this, you know, just type in Tarsakta. It's going to take you to Israel, all right, today. Today is Israel, all right. And so we're like, why is it on? on these maps. I mean, even this map by William Blue, B-L-A-E-U, 1650 shows Tara Sancta, and this is a map of Palestine, which would be Jerusalem, Israel, all these areas, Middle East, but they also call it Tara Sancta, which means holy land, right? The holy land. And we said, Manaka, what is Tara Sancta doing in this unmapped area of Antarctica that we ain't supposed to know because when we look at this area even on the maps they even show an area this big what do we see nothing to see here boss no tar to here boss okay I'm just talking Israel <laughs> We're just talking to our Sancta. They call it Palestine. Nothing to see here, boss. But everything to see here, boss. 
Tara Sancti. The Holy Land, Israel. Now, <laughs> you know, I'm not saying, oh, this is where, you know, the Israel must be, and yada, yada. You know, we're just surfing away of monogatry. I'll chill out, but it could be. It could be when you start, you know, factoring in the high Amazon, you know, situation, and these queens, you know, that were protecting, you know, these areas, even in Antarctica, and they're called Amazon queens. You like, but Antarctica's full of snow. And I'm like, nah, my naga, no. So, you know, I'm going to get back to the islands. I want to talk Philippines. I want to talk Hawaii and Kama. <laughs> Kamaya, Kamaya. I would say Kamaha, Kamaha, the king of Hawaii. You know, just revisit his story a little bit. We're just talking Preston. So you see us going from, you know, Tacum say ten Skatahawa push Mataha, you know, all that flow, you know, into, you know, this uh Kamahamaha, this Hawaiian priest kings and into the the Nagas of the Philippines and just as you know, cause we we gotta get a full perspective of how they accomplish what they accomplish, you know. No so-called whites can do all this, man. <laughs> Shut down the entire Antarctica. This has to come from some strong harmonics, man. I mean, it used to be popping off, Taurus Sancta style, right out of outside of South America. It must have taken some real strong harmonics, man, to throw this flow off. But we got more rains popping off because the glaciation lines, because the moraine is where rocks and soil deposited by retreating glaciers are formed right what the hell are glaciers doing in america and you're calling it a little ice age man but you say that one of the symptoms or causes that have been proposed is the epidemics emerging from european contact so the invasion of the european caused an ice age but it couldn't have happened without the treaties, man. The treaties, man. They still enjoying their treaties today. Again, man, it's our chemical serpent versus our chemical dragon. And that's at the heart of the energetic frequency. Because at the heart of the dragon is the living spirit that they're extracting. The Ruach, this is what they're extracting. The Ruach, Managa, the living spirit. Who's extracting it? Androgyny, the Baphomet, the Mahomet, right? We got this, you got it. The cosmic serpent is not the dragon. Maybe it was the dragon in the garden that lost his wings. Had to squirm up out of there but we know it brings everything to life but also kills everything kills what the dragon because they're slaying the dragon my naga with the coming together of opposites can they slay the alchemical dragon the connie and shio coming together of opposites means what, man? Coming together opposites means that uh, <laughs> a place <laughs> like Antarctica can just disappear and become a little blot called Terra del Fuego. The coming together of opposites means that the land of fire turns into the land of ice. Uh, let me get my tea. It's Preston 90. You know I've been going hard, my naga, but we're doing this together. And I just want to, you know, I just felt so good coming out of Joy World, all the support we've been getting, all my nagas, man. I just feel so good, man. I, I just had to give you this, you know what I'm saying? You deserve this. This is well overdue. Crank him up. 
crank it back up to press the investigation like a naga would, like a naga should. This is exciting to investigate you because it's cutting through the truth everywhere. The more and more war, the Byzantium, you know, the, the Russian, you know, chronologies, you know what I'm saying? The China flow, we're going to get on this China today, the Philippines to Hawaii, <laughs> everywhere, boss, Spain and Europe and everywhere. Nowhere, nowhere is protected from the Preston. He's the king of the world. The Khan of Khan. Talking Khan Dawi. So even when we talk Kamahamaha, <laughs> Kamaya, 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 you know what I'm saying? You know, all this is Nagas that are descendants, just like the Kumse of these Hebrews. You know, I'm, I can't. I can't vouch for the character of all these priest kings. You got some that were on, some that were off. Even Genghis Khan will call himself a priest king. He stole the title Khan. Genghis Khan became Khan by going to war with the Khan. Press the job. In 1202, they say. Everybody want to be Khan. The, the Pope is the press. The Pope wants to be the Khan. King of Vatican City. Priest of the world. Priest king. Press the job. Creation of opposites turn fire to ice. The bring, the bringing together of opposites turn fire to ice. In India, superior, my not. Right. So Tarzanta. <laughs> Tara Sant. Where we get our there we go. It's very amazing, you know, and it's something like this map is amazing. Look to the bro Sakow. Sakow rigid now. Man, said cool, we appreciate you, man. You even see Phoenicia, Phoenicia. Um, you know, what is anywhere stamped? Tarzanta or Holy Land, you can't overlook it, man. If I just type in Google right now, and again, I don't see this Holy Land right here. I don't see this Holy Land in Morocco. What? That's not a part of Morocco? Why not? Come on, man. <laughs> Come not. Nah, don't stop now, Morocco. You're going you gonna to stop right here? What about all this pop offness? He's gonna put an ice wall up. That can't be represented. I don't see that represented here. Damn, Atlantis, is that where you stop? <laughs> or is that Atlantis too? Everything's Atlantis, man. Huh? That's Atlantis too. Tarzan, do you want that too? All that is for him. <laughs> Nah, man, it seems that <clears throat> this holy land, you know, if you type it in, just Tara Sancta, this is all they're going to give you. Holy land, right? They're going to tell you it's holy land. They got Tara Zanta churches everywhere. <clears throat> Um, you know, Jerusalem, yeah. So they're going to take you right to their side of the map. They're going to take you to Jerusalem, Palestine. We showed you that, right? Images. Oh, you got a retreat. You can go to Tarasan to retreat, you know, way out there, you know. They got Tara Santa wine. <laughs> They're not going to tell you nothing about Antarctica, right? But they'll tell you about Palestine. What is... I mean, for real, for real, you know. 
What's Tara Santa doing here? <laughs> Tara Santa, hey, how to my naga popping off. Joy World, the water. Keep clicking these links and keep checking in and, you know what I mean? Just, just keep up with us, you know, keep up with these Nagas because we keep making Naga moves, man. And, you know, we in Utah, so we high. <laughs> we in Utah, a lot of why. The lofty, the high Nagas, <laughs> the Royals, the Cubs. We're talking Kalei Lu. We got the OIS be ready for my nuggets because we're gonna get right in to this China. I'm just thinking about this uh Kalelu's flow. Oh yeah, we got some dog headed drop as well. <laughs> I've been had some dog headed drop for my nuggets, so you know, don't don't mind me. Dog head coming right up. <laughs> We're gonna talk Philippines. Oh, it's gonna be fun. All right, so we got everything in, in order. Uh, let's dig on this one right here. I just wanna talk a labels right quick. Love to uh, Aaron Ben Gilad dot blog spot. You got the links below. Uh, there was another blog spot that was, man, it had all the drop, you know. I know I printed some of it out. Hopefully we made a PDF somewhere as well. Knowing, knowing the Oc Tracy, we got it somewhere as well. So I don't even trip. But, you know, we, we've been talking about Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cotto, Tecumseh War, all this, you know. And again, you know, we don't know what's all facts and all this. You know, we're just putting it on a table, seeing how it flows. We're jumping back and forth in the timelines here. I'm just talking to Tari and I just want to, See how some of this might, you know, let's see if they go into anything. I know they went into some of the more DNA base, you know. But another one we had, you know, they, they had another whole story that was popping off on this. Let me go back a little bit. Oh, I'll read this part first. It says, uh, all right, so we had elite Hebrews, okay. <laughs> who ruled over different tribes in Arkansas, Mississippi, and the surrounding areas. Now you have a queendom popping off, right? And here it says the queen was known as Davida, like David. So you, you got a King David and a Queen David, my nigga. <laughs> for real, for real. You got a Davida, a Dode, Doda. And often in the second to fifth century, now this is when even their, you know, Moroccan Catholic, you know, documents and all that are telling them that they, telling us they're coming over here around this time, the third century. Now, at, while they're coming over here, there's already the kingdom of Kalelu set up. So Morocco, you have to back back to Kalelu. So it's already popping off. You know what I'm saying? These red money, which means pomegranate, promised land. Joshua had to get the pomegranates to Ramah to prove that he was in Kalelu's, the promised land, the Judah. This is already happening. Now, the Cherokee people, today it says descend from these Judeo-Roman Amazon. Like, you putting all this together? You, you ain't never put Romans with Amazons with Judah before, man, Judeo. Never, man. You know what I'm saying? With Cherokee? You ain't never put Cherokee with the tribe of Judah with the red mind, which in Hebrew means pomegranate connected with promised land, Amazon. You know, the Amazon's flowing out of Mount Rima. We'll get back on that Rima, man, which we just talking tree of life, right? I mean, we got to get there. We're, we're in terrestrial paradise. We're talking Eden. It's not over there because it's all happening right here already. Connecting the Cherokee with the Judeo, Remani, Amazon, the Queendom, and the Kingdom. 
because they were intermarrying with the Judean Roman or Remani kings. This is all Hebrews, Judah, the tribes. Kalelus means promised land. Get that series. We're coming in hot in the fifth wave with Kalelus. Okay. So this elite ruling group, as well as some of the pagan American Indians. So it says the Cherokee people today descend from this Judeo or Judah, all right, elite ruling group, as well as some of the pagan American Indians. So some are Israelites. Some would be considered outside of the house of Israel. Okay. So then they went to name the Ishmaelites. Got it. The Ishmaelites, as we just got, are marching up a storm around here, right? Ben Ishmael out of the Ohio Valley gathering in Kentucky. They start joining the war, right? The Kentuckians get all these volunteers. I wonder who they're setting up their Muhammad, their Mecca, and their Morocco, and Cairo, right here in America, Lake Michigan, Chicago, Indianapolis. Louisville, Kentucky, right? <laughs> They're setting up all over. They're migrating. We just putting this together with different sources. All right. So, yeah, they're here, right? Okay. So, these elite ruling groups of Judea, Remani, Amazons are here along with pagan American Indians, such as Ishmaelites while other groups such as Cotto, Choctaw, and Chalkasaws were under the queen's rule and authority. All right. So, you know, they're not calling Chalkasaws and Chicksaws a bunch of pagans, don't look like. They're just saying that they were under the rulership of Judah, <laughs> which would make sense. It's called order, my life. You can't change the most high's order. What you can do is you know, play your position because we need a strong team, right? Nobody want to play their position. Nobody want to be a unit, right? <laughs> Everybody want to be the con. Con, con. Yeah, you know, you can surf the wave in this block spot. Again, you know, it's not like the other one we... We're able to, you know, really dig on, but this does got some stuff in it, man. You know, that could be connected to some thing things. They go into DNA a lot more, you know what I mean? And you know how we feel, man. A lot of hijacking that. Uh the Jewish Kalelos. Uh-huh. Right, right. Right. So you remember some of this stuff right here? Because they're finding artifacts in Arizona. They're finding swords, they're finding all kinds of stuff with Latin, Greek, and Hebrew on it. Catholic, huh? <laughs> are we just talking Cathay? Jewish, are we just talking Hebrew? Ritual objects and symbols. Cyclone Covey discovers or describes this discovery in his book, Kalelus, a wave surfers know, live, you know, fourth with two to drop, man. We've been reading this book for years. <laughs> Because it's always so amazing to dig on, you know, just the rawness, you know, of what they're finding, you know, these artifacts. So Covey and other researchers are amazed at the mixture of Jewish, Christian, and Kabbalistic objects. So we're just talking Hebrew stuff. They say Christian because they're seeing crosses, but these crosses are the Hebrew Tau. However, this very much fits this period in the 8th century when the Carolingian Empire, there is a Jewish principality in southern France called Septimania, ruled by Theodoric de Narbonne, Machir. So this Jewish principality are Hebrew, right? Now, they're talking southern France, but we already know. You know, Septimania, all these seven cities is already here. Machir, Tadros, Ben Judah. So whether we're getting it over there, over here, you keep seeing this Judah, and he's also called Magnario, Amari, Amer. And now we're talking America, and this is in the 
eighth century, seven hundreds. But no, America's named after Amerigo Vespucci. What? <laughs> I'm talking seven hundreds, man. A Marie is already here. See, this that. This is the story they don't want you to know. This is the Hebrew story in America they don't want you to connect to. I'm talking Prestors, right? We can't talk to Kumse being a Hebrew without seeing clearly the lineage that the Kumse is coming out of. He's springing out of Septimania, seven cities, Septimania. He's springing out of the Makir, the, Ju, the Ben Judah, the Amari, the Amir, Amari. Many members of his family descend from the exilarchs of Babylon embraced a Hebrew form of Catholicism. Come on, man. What's it, what is a Jewish form of a Catholic, man? They just don't want to say these are the tribes of Judah, the Israelites. They can't say Israelites, so they got to say Roman, Jewish, uh, Christian, Catholic. <laughs> He can't say Hebrew Israelites, right? <laughs> right. So we already know, man. The Kalelus records speak of a Theodorus as a leader of many peoples who leave the Reman, Reman lands for Kalelus in 775 AD. Covey and others believe that Theodorus is a Hebrew leader in the city of Rome. Oh, of course, we got the Byzantine. So I uh, love to Anatoly from Manco. You got the initial Rome, which ain't the same as, you know, whatever Rome hijacked, you know, that we're being retaught of, you know, Rome is just reminding. So, you know, you got promised land here. You got a promised land of where they're gathering over there. You know, you got a Jerusalem here. You got a Jerusalem there, you know, both sides of these Asia's, but it's all connected, you know, through India Superior the Straits of Anian, Anan, it's all connected. However, this is too literal reading of the term Rome. Theodorus is none other than the Hebrew king of Septimania. A Hebrew Remani state in southern France. He is the son of the first Hebrew king of Septimania, also called Theodorus. So his father was also called Theodoric Mary. So he was a Mary. America, and his dad was also a Mary and Makir. Theodorus the Diedric, Theodoric a Mary, again, also known as Nehemiah, Namon, Amor Ben Amor, Amaru, is also known as Theodoric, King of Saxony. These are all Nagas, man. I want you to just understand where. All these Nagas here that we just got all their DNA and the elite ruling, all this is coming from Nagas already here. What are you talking 7th century, 5th century, 4th century? What are we talking about? This can't all be Morocco, man. Man, tell Theodorus this is Morocco, man. <laughs> tell, tell Sylvanus to Texas this is Morocco. Tell him to walk around that cube, man. And they, they can't be Jewish because they ain't even converted yet in the 700s. And they can't be Jewish walking around no cube. So either way, nobody here that we're talking about is walking around your cube. But this is all Morocco, Ham and Kush. We searching for the press that we got to cut right through you just to get it out. Just to gut it out. It's in the intestines. It don't smell good. You've dirtied up the name of the press. You've hit it. You've hit Tara Sancta. <laughs> you've changed the maps. You flipped the maps. You've invaded all these nagas here. You put treaties on the head ball. Froze them out with an ice age. What more can we take, man? We got to talk about this, right? Somebody got to speak clearly. Professor Arthur Zuckerman, in his book, A Jewish Princedom in Feudal France, confuses him with his father, who bears the same Frankish name, Theodoric Anna Mary. 
All right, so on the death or abdication of his father, Machir Theodoric, in about 765 AD, Nehemiah Theodoric becomes the Western Exilarch and leader of all the Jews of the revived Western Roman Empire of Charlemagne. And Charlemagne just means great king, right? So there's a lot that we don't understand based on history, his story. And this Western Roman Empire ain't the same as this whole, you know, uh, remake. You know what I'm saying? These Hebrews are popping off out of exile. You have an exilarch when you've been invaded, like Babylonian exilarchs. Now we're talking David Sosnick. We'll be back in that flow. I'm just giving you the well-rounded Presta flow because we're coming back in out with the, you know, the Roger Harajas and David Sauslins and, you know, searching through the Queen Tamar flow and all that. I just had to give you the indigenous truth. Cut through these treaties, more and more war to Kumse. Now we're back in Kalelu's love to Daniel Lowe. A lot of this is his recon or well, probably all of this right here. Uh, out of the book Forbidden Histories of America. We're just surfing the wave. Don't mind us. You know, we're just connecting some things. In 775, Nehemiah Theodoric reconquered the American Empire of Kalelus. Not Morocco, right? That's funny. Because if it was Morocco, they'll be talking sultans all day. But we're talking Hebrews, who they keep calling Jewish. Rema. Rema. Rema ni. <laughs> Rema. Rema. Word of the day. Rema. Hebrew for pomegranate. They turn it to Roman, right? I just want to just remember. I just want to remember with you. So Rema turned into Roman. Okay. Kalelus was ruled by Sylvanus Tall, Texas. This is where you're popping off the tall tech. Sylvanus is Solomon, the builder, the hereditary, meaning by birthright ruler of this Hebrew ruled Romani colony. Nah, this is Nagaville, man. You're not colonizing like they are. The colonizer likes calling somebody else a colonizer. <laughs> they just found you here. They found King Solomon right here. Leader of the Toltec. Toltec pop off right into, you know, these lines, these Israelites, these, these tribes of Israel popping right into these Toltec lines. Kitsukawaru right into it. All this is the same thing. These are Israel, the Taltecs, the Aztec, <laughs> all the tribes of the Shikamagua, the Cherokee. But the titles are being stolen. The titles are being hijacked. And this is where we're dodging all hijacks. You got King Solomon here. Is he walking around your cube? Where's your cube now? I ain't talking 1785. Managa, I'm talking 775. You see, I just went back a thousand years. A thousand years on you. They say they were here a thousand years before Colombo. Okay. So were you fighting the Swan Knights, the Barber Hagazi? Or can we add a thousand years to this and now we back in 1775? Shikamago War. What should we do? Should we add a thousand years here? Or should we take a thousand years away from what you're talking about <laughs> and put you as a recent invader? Maybe you are Columbus. 
Maybe the Columbus invasion is the more and more war. His story, who are you going to believe? I'm talking Ice Age. Ice Age that happened after the fall of Kalelus. Right now we're, we're witnessing a family war going on. Could be northern, southern tribes, but it appears to be both sides of these tribes connected with David. And they are themselves going at it for control of this American empire in 775 AD. Kalelus was founded in the first century BC by the Babylonian exilarch known as Sylvanus Ogon. We got to research the Ogon script. Sylvanus Bravo, Solomon II, Babylonian exilarch, Nazi of Marath. Slow down. Slow down. We done been here before, right? So Kalelus, they're saying it's found in first century BC. Okay. <laughs> so I think that's before Morocco either way, right? But it's by the Babylonian exilarch known as Sylvanus Ogam. And if he's a Babylonian exilarch, that means that this captivity is going on. Is Babylonian captivity in the first century BC? Or like Anatoly Fermenko, have they done a chronological time shift? Can we push it back a thousand years? You tell me, first century BC or, you know, a thousand, eleven hundred AD. I mean, that this is all happening, you know, all popping off. Because we're just talking nights. Now, Bravo, Solomon II, Babylonian exilarch, Nazi of Mara, ruler of summer. Now, I don't know if this got anything to do, because, you know, they say Sumer set in Britain, and they put all this in parentheses like it's just... Uh, you know, their own conjecture. <laughs> Love to the tip, Lord. What it do, man? You know, we've been surfing this way. A lot of people like to bring up all this inky flow and Sumerian flow. And you're going to have to at least dig on the rule of Sumer when you talk Sumerian. You're going to have to maybe connect to a little more recent thing. Maybe BC, maybe not, but you're going to connect it back to the Solomons, back to the Bravo. A great Roman Jewish ruler, <laughs> a Hebrew priest king, prester, soldier, and ancient or ancestor of the Swan Knights, which are the Barber. Ping, pow, you see? You know how you flown down here in 1776 and you're like, Shikamagua, 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 Shikamagua. And then it gets into uh, no major war, but you know that this uh, treaty of what, Finity or something like that is happening, giving up Ohio, everything's happening again, right around this no major war situation. They're making major treaties. Here comes the Barbar. And you would not know to connect this <laughs> still with your indigenous selves, right? Because I'm just talking about American Empire of Kalelus. The American Empire. America, right? Does, does North America exist? India Superior, right? And in India Superior, <laughs> there's something called Swan Nights. These swan knights are the ships of Solomon. They are the knights of Solomon. Right? Templar knights, knights of the round table, right? They are barbars, barbars, which is why you're having the Barbary Wars. They have their own story. This is our story. You told your story. We're telling our story. 
these barbars are the Ramans, the Romans. Hebrew word of the day, right? Reman. We just got connects, you know, they like to cover up the article now, but we just got connects directly with the pomegranate right here. Hebrew for both pomegranate and grenade, because you definitely popping off. <laughs> They changed the Ramon to Roman. And with Barbar, ain't that a Hebrew word of the day too? Hebrew word of the day. Uh, let's go Barbar. 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 <laughs> Yeah. Oh, come on, man. Oh, man. No accounts, man. Hijack City. Hijack City. Well, we'll just pick it up from here. I mean, you, you see it in different ways. Barbar, noun meaning swan. Swan. Some say foul. <laughs> If you look it up in the concordance, it's barbarine, fowl, like bird, right? Bird, specifically managa, swan. And that's a very important flow right there. So barbar means swan, got it? That's validating, that's validating. <laughs> That when it says swan knights, it's saying bar bar, right? Swan. Okay. All right. Validation. Bar bar now meaning swan. Bar bar. Barbary war, right? Barbary war. Tacoma say war. These are your titles. I can't make this up. This is back to the American empire going back to Bravo. Soldier and ancestor of the Swan Knights, letting you know that you were knights. You're not just Indians like they're saying, you know, dancing around a teepee, Managa. Like, you're knights. There's swords and kalalus coming out of the ground. <laughs> right? You're, you're, you're fighting a hijack from day one. The barber Hakatzin, he also had a fleet of trading vessels known as the ships of Solomon or the Swan Boats. The ships are shaped like a swan with its sail like the wings of a beautiful gliding white swan. Imagine the beauty of these ships shaped like a swan. This is happening in America in the 700s, they say. After the defeat of Sylvanus to Texas, the members of the royal family. All right, so these are royals. These are not Moroccans. They're not walking around your cube or harmonics. All right, you, you can't juxtapose them and put them, you know, in your version of a maxim. Come on, this is disrespectful is what we're saying. This is why we are popping off. And you you, you got to get this word. Got to. And I guess when Atlantis, you know, was still up and there was no Atlantic Ocean, you know, you could still navigate and take riverways or, you know, some type of streams through. Very interesting, huh? According to this map. That stream will take you all the way through <laughs> South America, all the way through to Africa, right? The Kush, the Canaan. Through the Gulf of uh, Maxim, Mexico, Maxim, Mexi, all the way through the Mississippi, all the way back across into Europe. <laughs> They're showing you how they're mooring it up, but we're just talking more rains and glaciations. More rains and glaciation lines. Nah, 
they were popping off around this cube, man. This is uh, the royal family of Israel. Whether you put them in the 700s, the BCs, <laughs> or more recently with the Kumse in the 1700s and 1800s, your royal family exists. We're validating the biblical history, but we're including the indigenous facts. They're saying Tukumse is the chief of the Israelites, right? He, he's, there's no separation between him and the Hebrew priest kings we're getting, you know, out of their documents. <laughs> so how many times do we got to hear it? What did they do when they found us here? Why did they roll up like this? What did Columbus say about it? Hold up, man. Y'all remember what Columbus had to say about this situation, man? Let's see if we got it here, man. We just surfing the wave in the press to pack, man. <laughs> hey, out to all my nuggets, you know, supporting the flow. And uh, this is our time capsule to make sure, you know, we can keep it flowing, man. Keep it fluid. You know what I mean? And, you know, try to get hijacked as little as possible, if, if at all, man. Just keep surfing the wave steady. They know who they were rolling up on. That's all we've been saying. You know. This is out the exegesis of empire towards a post-colonial reading of Christopher Columbus El Libro de la Profecia. Book of Prophecies by John Pierre Ruiz, St. John University. Okay. We're going to go right into it because we got a lot to talk about. Among the earliest and most fascinating witnesses to the latter is a manuscript of 84 folios, 84 pages, dated between September 13, 1501 and March 23rd, 1502, and now preserved in the Biblioteca Columbina in Sevilla, balcony surface. You already know we've been talking about this. Six years we've been talking about this. <laughs> it begins. This is the book, the beginning of the book or collection of authorities, authorities, my God. These are the authorities, the sayings, opinions, and prophecies concerning the need to recover the holy city and Mount Zion. Columbus didn't say I'm coming over here to find India. I'm lost. He's saying, here's my mission statement, man. Here's the prophecies. Here's what I'm doing. Here's what the authorities are saying. <laughs> the opinions, the prophecies concerning the need to recover the holy city. My now I'm talking Tara Zancta, right? Jerusalem, huh? Can you have that without Israel? So Columbus knew he was rolling up on Israel. He's looking for Mount Zion. And just so you know, he's talking about you and the discovery and conversion of the islands. Of the Indies, I'm talking India, superior, my God. And all peoples and nations, I want to convert all people, all nations. But he just told you which nations, the holy city. He wants to convert Israel. El Libro de Perfecias, the book of prophecies, was compiled by Christopher Colombo himself, man. We're going to talk St. Christopher, the dog-headed man, because I believe this is St. Christopher. You got a different Christopher in a timeline called St. Christopher. But you know what they do in the timelines? They drop them off in these, you know, separate places. 300 years back, 1,000 years back, they got St. Christopher popping off, what, in the 200s or something like that? And Christopher Columbus come in the 1400, that's a 1200 year time shift. But Anatoly Fermanko said, Scholar Gerbatavius did at least three 
chronological time shifts. 333 years. 1,053 years. In 1,778 years on average. So that's why we can say, oh, is that happening in 200? Maybe that's happening in 1,400 because you've shifted time at least 1,800 years sometimes. Or that's happening 600 BC. Maybe that's happening 1,200 AD. St. Christopher the dog head is happening 200 AD. Maybe that's the same Christopher Columbus in 1400 because saint christopher is called the patron saint of travelers wouldn't he also be called the patron saint of travelers after he discovers america a new world y'all ain't fooling us with this dog-headedness and these dog heads came over to recover the holy city mount zion to discover and convert the islands of the Indies of all people and nations. For Ferdinand and Isabella, our Spanish rulers, they came for the Holy City, man. We out of here. <laughs> Get in the press to pack, we popping off. The royal family, Sylvanus to Texas is here. The ships of Solomon looking like swan boats are already here before Columbus, before your cube. Well, this is Atlantis, huh? After the defeat of Savannah to Texas, the royal family were sent to Europe where they were under protection of Nehemiah Theodorus and his family. So he, clearly it was a family affair. He was, even the, you know, captives were under protection. They weren't being slaughtered and crucified. So this family war was a royal family war. And those that, you know, were defeated were sent to Europe, you know, where they already got the Ruses and, you know, the whole situation going down with the Bezant team and Mazaka and Mossad. They already got their, you know, situation. So, you know, this is what's going on in 775. The legends of Dune and Ogier are based on the activities of this family. Descended from Duan, Duan, Antigone, Ogier. So you got all these legendary Ogiers, uh, Og and uh, uh, Dan, and they call them Antico, this uh, Tuatha de uh, Danun, and all that. Sylvanus Bravo or Solomon Barber. So the Bravo is the Barber. <laughs> Barbary War, right? You can't take the barber title if you ain't a bravo. And if you ain't a bravo, hey, what you here for? This is Kalelus. This is America, man. <laughs> this is the American Empire. What are you here for, Morocco? I mean, we're just asking these questions because somebody got to stand up for the land, you see. Not the colonizer, not the Atlantean, everything must be a Maxim perspective, but Hawa, the barbar, the swan. <laughs> yeah, Tawatha de Dana, all this is already here, also known as Manana or Maine of America. But now they renamed a state called Maine way there, you know, northeast. <laughs> but Maine was originally right there near Arizona. Man and Ann, four corners of America. Where the giant ogre heads are. Oh, here's the giveaway. In case you didn't know they were talking about y'all. <laughs> the giant ogre heads of the Almec are found. <laughs> now we're talking the she, the she, she. We're going to get back on our she flow, man. Because the army called themselves the she. And Genghis Khan was at war against the she. Like the Presta. 
giant ogre heads like Shrek, right? Shrek is about the Almec. These people invaded his pond. <laughs> he wanted to be left alone. They kept jamming him up. Yeah, man, that's you. The Almec are already here, connected with Sylvanus Tall Texas. The Toltec, the Almec, the Aztec, the Irish legend of Regamon also allude to this family. So the Irish, the Scottish. Yeah. Then you got Rhoda, which they also renamed Rhode Island over there, right? The Jews or the Hebrews of this ancient Roman Remani, Rema, pomegranate, Hebrew kingdom of Rhoda. Now, they were also known as Rodons or Rodhanites and were the great Hebrew merchants who controlled the ancient sea routes or trade routes. So they'll say the Moors, Phoenician, this and that. They were the Rodhanites. These were the Rodons. These are the kingdom of Rhoda that controlled the ancient trade routes. This is the Eberus, the Hebrews, the ancient ones. The Rhone Valley and River were named after these Jewish or Hebrew Radhan merchants who, and you know these ain't no Jews today, <laughs> controlling all these ancient trade routes. Man, in the 700s in America, you kidding? They'll be bragging about this all day. Then they got to be the ones that got rolled up on by Columbus because they got to claim to be the Toltecs, right? They got to claim to be the Toltecs. That's why the Jews can't claim to be the Toltecs. Because then they're the ones that got invaded by Columbus. <laughs> they're the ones that paid for the boats to invade themselves. Uh, they paid for the boats, man, <laughs> to invade you, to invade the real Rhoda, to take the titles of the Judah, who's the original merchants, the original ancient trade routes, you know, controllers. Many of them settled in Ireland, right? Nagas in Ireland. Now you're on your brave heart flow. <laughs> in the first century AD, uniting with their cousins descended from St. Joseph of Arimathea, Isaac Kalanimus, the son of Nehemiah Theodoru, was also known as Isaac the Rodhanite, the Rodanite. IBN Cordia Beas account of the Rodanites stresses their source somewhere beyond the Western Sea in the land of the Franks. You remember the Franks and the Rus were together to form the Knights, the Templar. So the Franks and the Rus formed the Templar. The Rus are connected all the way to, you know, well, obviously Russia and the kingdom of Rus and all that, but, you know, this Theodore Rus and all these, you know, cons, you know, this Theodore Rus, all this is, man, I got all this is Israel. All these are your titles. When they talk all, oh, man, <laughs> they just giving it up right in your face, bomb. The giant heads of the old man are fat. We're talking Maine, right? Man and Man, which was right there in the four corners. You dog. So then it connected with King Arthur, man. We're just talking Preston, man. Working our way back into the romances. In the fifth century, Kalelus was part of the revived Western Empire of King Arthur, a descendant of the Swan Knights by the eighth century due to admixture with the American Indians. The state had reverted to paganism. Man. But we know King Arthur <laughs> didn't exist. Like we're about to get in a uh, Prester John Legend and his sources. You know, all this is coming out of the Prester flow, the David flow. Prester John, you know, they started writing stories under this King Arthur, but Arthur means order. The king of the order is the Prester. So all this is Prester flow. With the connecting him with the Swan Knights, which means he's being connected to Sylvanus, to Texas, right? 
rule of Sumer, Barber Ha Ka Ha Kazin, the Swan Knives. Barber, Bravo, right? So let's go. So by the eighth century, due to admixture with the American Indians. So which ones? Which what tribe are we talking about? The state had reverted to paganism. Nehemiah Theodorus led an expedition in 775 to return Kalelus to Jewish and Roman rule or Hebrew Romani rule. So whatever he's saying, you know, Theodorus or Nehemiah felt like, you know, the code wasn't being kept because of some type of paganism. He got to return it, you know what I'm saying, to, you know, true you know, Judah rule, you know what I mean? He he conquered the ancient city of Rhoda and the Jewish law was restored. And again, it always reminds me of the script, you know, where after the king, after uh, the death of King Solomon, you know, the kingdom was divided. You know, they said all this uh, idolatry of King Solomon and these altars and stuff like that. So, you know, just try to, you know, look at how this is lining up, you know, with the biblical history. We're just talking about the forbidden histories of America. Again, love to Daniel Lowe, um, and the blog spot author, you know, is doing a good job documenting uh, this uh, source as well. So some paganism was popping off around the end of this Solomon flow, just like the script, the kingdom's divided. You got a tribal war, right? In this case, you got Nehemiah coming in to restore it, right? Jewish law, he wants to restore the code. After four years in 779 AD, Nehemiah Theodorus left Kalelus for the kingdom in France, which he had left in the hands of his brother, Gualame de Golini. Mar Nathan, okay, all right, Kalonomis. So these are all different titles. He then appointed a British David Prince Jacob as the Jewish king of Kalelus. Ah, so this might, when we talked about the Kumse tribing up with British allies, again, we said we don't know which ancestors and tribes we're talking about that's coming out of this area at that time of what they call Great Britain. And again, Brit means covenant. Brit means covenant. So the indigenous Brit is the covenant code keeper Hebrew setting it off over there in that part of the, you know, Nagaville over there, man. It's Nagaville over there too, man. Look to my UK Nagas and, you know what I'm saying? We, we, we had the vortexes popping off. So this might be a link into, you know, who the Hebrews are on the British side of this American Revolutionary War because they already were popping off these uh, Davidic means that they're coming out the David seed, my naga. So these are Davidic princes. And there was a Davidic prince named Jacob already there <laughs> in Britain. You know what I'm saying? So you had a whole Hebrew kingdom that I believe might be who these Chickamauga or, you know, St. Tecumseh and all them were tribing up, allying on that particular side, knowing that people were coming from everywhere over here, you know, we have fam over there, like, yo, I'm gonna come over there, man. And you know what I'm saying? So this could be where the alliance is. We're just talking about the royal family, right? The Hebrew royal family. So Jacob was a descendant of King Arthur as well as, or you could easily say King David, you know what I'm saying? As well as the Jewish royal family of Bernice here. Okay. So, because we're talking Davidic kings, so, you know, David is in play. If everything's about these Davidic princes, King David's line is in play. And they keep trying to change it with this, you know, uh, phantom of King Arthur's descendants, which he don't exist. He's coming really from this Davidic flow. They're just turning this into an authorian, they call it authorian history. Fake genealogy, where Monmouth created a fake genealogy out of this author flow. So Jacob was a descendant of King Dawi. <laughs> they just said he's a Davidic prince, <laughs> as well as the Hebrew royal family of Bernicia. Jacob was the leader of the British Jewish settlers in Kalelus. The Roman 
Hebrew settlers of Kalelus in the 8th century were made up of two main groups, the Latin Hebrew group from the Frankish Empire and the British Hebrew group from the British Isles. And then they put this picture up, letting you know they talk about you, the all make ogre image, right? <laughs> right, so it's all about you, man. Not, not one time have I spoke on none of this stuff that had nothing to do with you. We still talking Swan Knights? Nehemiah Theodoric Hamakiri reigned in Germany until his death in 790 AD. Remember, Germany was all the swarthy Nagas, right? What did Benjamin Franklin say? He was one of Charlemagne's leading advisors. He learned about the land of Kalelus from Gerard, a member of the Swan Knight family that came to Charlemagne's court in a swan boat. Talking Solomon in them, man. Eh? He married Adalis, a daughter of Nehemiah, a.k.a. Duke Naaman. These are the royals, man. This is why you got family crests, man. All right. The Swan Knight's ancestors had come to Ireland from Kalelus in the second, third century. So we've been popping off in Ireland, Scotland, man. Intermarried with the descendants of Nathan the Red, Nathan the Rodan. We're just talking about the Rodan Knights and the kingdom of Rhoda, who's controlling the uh, the merchant flow, right? So grandson of Joseph, Mar Joseph of Arimathea. Mar Joseph was the grandson of Sylvanus Ogam, or Bravo, or Barbar, Barbary treaties, right? Confederate against the Barbar, they just taking a Barbar title, but they're not the... Remani Hebrew Khan. Warrior who defeated the giant. Oh, Mar Joseph. Joseph was the grandson of Sylvanus Oga or Bravo. And he's the one who defeated the giant American emperor of Oga or Ogir called Juran Antego. And in the, in the Bible, they talk about Og or some type of King Og and all that's connected with this Moab situation as well, man. We can't get away from Moab, man. But, you know, they got these giants coming out of Moab, you know what I mean? This, I think it's King Og and some other guy, but anti Gong, Drew, you know, they just talking about the American emperor of Og, right? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so... Damn, damn. Now, how can we fit this into the, into the flow, into the script? Because, you know, here's another priest king who's going up against a giant, just like Moses, just like David. And I said before, this seems like a David flow with this Bravo since Solomon is coming after him, right? You got Solomon. First, you guys. They say Kalelus was formed in the first century BC by the Babylonian exilarch known as Sylvanus Ogam. So they start with Bravo as the founder of Kalelus. They don't say David, but then they start talking Davidic kings and all these princes out of David, but they're not calling Bravo David, but David did fight a giant. Dawi pressed it. Presta did go up against the Giants. The Giants are in the kingdom of Presta. So are the dog heads. You're about to get that next, man. All right. It's all coming together. It's all, it's all happening. I'm just getting warmed up, man. You know what I mean? It's just, we're just getting started, man. It's Presta John, uh, starman number 90, my nine. Who or who is Presta John? Okay, so this is just another hard hit, my nigga, that this Ogon or Bravo or Berber, you know, either this giant was named or this king of Og, you know, was, was named after, you know what I'm saying, what Ogon had already been popping off, like this giant was trying to take over calling himself King Og, whatever, you know, or he got nothing to do with nothing. Could be something, could be nothing. But 
we have a barber or a swad knight, Bravo, who is the founder of Kalelus, who is the great Romani Hebrew warrior, like David, like Preston, right? Who defeats the giant. American Emperor of Ogan. So there was a giant American Emperor of Ogam or Ogir called Druon Antagon. To let you know we're talking about a giant. The next line says Druon means oak. So why are we talking oak trees, man? Is we talking giant? As giant as an oak, man. <laughs> Goes up against David or Bravo. And out of Bravo comes what? I mean, the Swan Knights, the Barber Hakazin. Now they start getting on the ships of Solomon. So Solomon is coming after the Bravo. Sylvanus told Texas he's the hereditary ruler because he's the son of David or Bravo, depending on how we see in this super warrior who's taking on a giant just like David did, right? Who has a son, hereditary ruler, who is Solomon. But the founder is the exilarch David or Bravo, who is also under this title. So, so these David titles, Solomon titles, they go back even before this is picking up. We're just picking up in the story, but a lot has happened before this, right? There's a Solomon before this. There's David's before that, David. Nasi of Mara, Nasi, ruler of Sumer. Okay. A great. Hebrew ruler, soldier, ancestor. So he's all that. This bravo. This barbar. All these legends are coming out of this. Barbar, bravo. This great warrior defeats the giant, right? <laughs> Antakum. Or oak. And describes the stature of Atigon because this oak describes the stature of the giant that the Hebrew warrior had to defeat. Sound familiar? We're just validating the scripture in the timeline, in the press investigation. The Ogam script was named for Sylvanus Ogam, uh, Solomon II, or Shalom. Sulam, Selim, Silvius, Salvius, Salvo. All right, so when they talk Sylvanus, Sylvanus is Salimah. By title, right? Sylvanus to Texas is Salimah, Khan of the Tolteca, the builder. And he brought this script called the Ogon script, which is, you know, something we really got to dig on. He brought this script from America, my naga, to Europe. And we traced it down a little bit, connecting with some of this Celt, uh, Celtic flow. And again, we've been talking about Ireland, right? and how they went to Ireland in the second century. So why wouldn't this script be connected with the Celtic flow? And the Celtic flow, <laughs> you know what I mean, has everything to do with the Hebrews. So uh, this is where they get, you know what I mean, all this is all happening, man. The Scottish back to the roots, right? They say that the roots started in Scotland, but you got the Scotia, which is a pharaoh's daughter named Scotia. All this is happening. 
Ogham or Ogham is the legendary home of the Ogres or the Almec culture of Mexico. Who or who is Preston John? So this all mag Mexi, Mexican <laughs> is the Ogam or the Bravo or the Barbar, what they call ogre, which they got the Shrek popping off. All these scary ogres were about you being being afraid of the Mexican, the all mag, the Toltec, Salimane and them. Because you defeat giants, man. You defeat the Giants. <laughs> All right. So the land of Preston John is a vast land. They don't even tell you nothing else popping off past a certain barrier, past a certain point. Tarzanta is holy land. Israel. Columbus said, I'm looking for the holy city. They don't give us the drive unless we're just talking Terry Fuego. Fuego. But then they say holy land is Palestine. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the land of Preston John. This is out the book, Preston John, the legend and its sources. And it's compiled a lot of crusade texts, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, when you're digging on the crusade text, you know, you got a lot of Christian hijacks. So they'll put they'll put stuff in here like, I am a devoted Christian. Like, yada, yada, I need to protect all the poor Christians. <laughs> that was their, you know, uh, their jargon, their propaganda so that they can get you know, these cowardice Christians to even come over here and fight, you know what I'm saying? Like they were afraid, but when they, when they heard the Preston was one of them, they said, Oh, okay. Come on. The press is going to help us. And nah, they, they had the wrong, they had the wrong thing uh, in mind. Cause a Hebrew priest King don't need to help a bunch of Christians or a bunch of Muslims. A Hebrew priest King is protecting Israel, protecting the Holy land from both of these hijacks. I don't think these Christians were fighting these Muslims like that. I think they were working together <laughs> to find the third India, working together to conquer Jerusalem together because it's a more and more war. If you truly wish to know the magnitude and excellence of our highness and in which the lands our power dominates, understand and believe without a doubt that I, Preston John, am Lord of Lords and exceed all kings of the entire earth in virtue. Stop. This don't say he was Moroccan. This don't say he was a Moabite. That's why they never talk, Preston John. You can't claim Con David. You can't claim David. You can't claim David. You can't claim nothing because David is the king of the entire earth, you see? That's why you go so crazy with your maps. A maximum maxim. You, you got to stomp, <laughs> stomp out Shem. Shem got to get the boot. Everyone got to get the boot because you want the earth, right? You want the entire earth. But Preston John is the Khan. Lord of lords and, and exceed all kings, all sultans, <laughs> all hijacks on the entire earth, my knock. In virtue, power, and all the riches which are under heaven. 72 kings are tributaries to us. They pay tribute. He ain't walking around no cube. And all the riches which are under heaven. 72 kings are tributaries to us. Here goes the Christian hijack, man. Let's, let's just get it from here, man. Let's just get it from here. 
our magnificence dominates in the three Indias. Let's just stay focused. And our land crosses from farther India. Whoa. We're talking India major, Asia major. Let's stay focused. So now you know there's three Indias. So when people say they from India, you got to say which one is three. You're talking India superior? India minor? But press the job, see? Our magnificence dominates. We are the head, not the tail. In the three Indias, all three. And our land crosses from farther India in which rests the body of St. Thomas, the apostle, through the desert and proceeds toward the sunrise and returns down into the Babylonian desert. Next to the Tower of Babel, 72 provinces serve us, of which few are made of Christians, and each one of them has its own king, who are all tributaries to us. We are the head, not the tail. We're not Moorish. We are Hebrew Khans. We are the tribes of Judah. We are the tribes of Hasharah. They pay us tribute. You see how this goes? This is why they kept you asleep. This is why they kept you asleep. But no more Ruwak Tarde Mama. 72 provinces serve us. And each one of them has its own king who are all paying tribute to us. In our land are born and raised elephants, dromedaries, camels, hippopotami. And love to aqua type battle for this. Amazing PDF. Crocodiles, Metagolarnari, Kamethithirnis. <laughs> yeah, you see it, man. Leopards, wild donkeys, white and red lions. I know it's going to sound crazy, right? <laughs> but, but you'll see that uh, <laughs> objects in the mirror <laughs> are closer than what they appear, man. The truth sounds stranger than fiction. You sip my tea, we're talking red and white line. White bears, white blackbirds, silent kakadas, griffins, tigers, jackals, hyenas, savage pigs as large as oxen with one teeth, with teeth one cubit long. Great savage dogs the size of Horses, whoa, whose ferocity exceeds that of every kind of wild animal, which are hunters steal while they are puppies in their mother's laps. <laughs> so his hunters are stealing these super duper large dogs while they're young to train them, I guess, you know, I mean, <laughs> I know not whether by skill, by incantation, or perhaps by trick and carefully raise and tame. Truly, after this, they become large and are thoroughly taught to hunt. Then they are shown to our majesty, and we often have 1,000 or more of them in our hunting party. Can you imagine them rolling up? Can you imagine Preston and rolling up with dogs the size of horses? <laughs> There are also raised in our land savage horses, savage donkeys, little horned men, little horned men. Uh, it, it gets it gets weirder, right? But Managa, you, you're talking Atlantis, right? You, you can't get away now. <laughs> you're talking to everything mythical and mythological you ever heard of and thought of right here in America, right? Con. <laughs> They say, oh, y'all y'all didn't have any horses. The white man brought the horses, man. We got dogs the size of horses. <laughs> the 
They are also raising our land savage horses, savage donkeys, little horned men, savage cows, savage men. And again, these are all, this is a translation, right? The presser didn't type this out in English. We were getting all this Christian hijack, but we're getting the babies out the bath water. Allow what? Savage men, all right? One-eyed men, here we go. Men with eyes in front and back. Men without heads, with their mouth and eyes on their chest. It's getting mighty strange in the land of Prescott, whose length is 12 feet, with their width six feet. In color, they are similar to purest gold. What? Gold people with without heads? Man. Men with 12 feet, six arms, 12 hands, four heads. And on each one of them, they have two mouths and three eyes. There are also born in our land women with great bodies, beards down to their breasts, flat heads, clothed in skins. I can't even, man, I mean, you're talking about Dr. Strange for real, for real. These most excellent huntresses raise beasts to hunt instead of dogs, lion against lion, bear against bear, stag against stag, and so on. Savage cows, archers, centaurs, savage men, horned men, fawns, satyrs, and women of the same race, pygmies, dog-headed men and giants whose height is 40 cubits. Then we just read about this giant that Sylvanus Bravo, the warrior, had to, you know, put down in Ogon. So as crazy as it sounds, you know, you got giants in the Bible. <laughs> you got, you know, some weird things, you know what I mean? So... Cyclopses, birds, one called Phoenix, uh-oh. Which means, you know, we got the dragons and they're going to talk about the dragons further along in this book. I mean, yeah. I mean, you see that uh, it was real descriptive, and I'm going to leave it for you. So, you know, it's right there in the drop library. You can always download it, man, and just dig on it. We've never really sat and read it all, like all of it, because it's connecting paradise with the land of Preston John, with all that weirdness you just read. It's talking about a forest situated at the foot of Mount Olympus, where a clear spring emerges, which preserves flavors of all types within it. Here we go with that mem sauce, man. Yosef, we popping off. The flavor changes every hour and day and night, and it proceeds by a journey of three days, not far from paradise. Here we go with that water. Paradise is near the, the land. <laughs> We got it on the British Museum, presses, up, presses over here. You know, I mean, <laughs> everything's happening in India Superior, from which Adam was expelled. So that's somewhere near the land of Presser. He, he's, he's, he's lining it up with the biblical flow. All right? So if, if any thirsty person drinks from this fountain three times, he will suffer no illness from that day forth. And he will always be as though he's 32 years of age. However long he lived. Magic water, magic fountains. Presta got the water. Why do you think you search for Hawa and Con David in the end of days? Somebody got to lead you to the water. <laughs> There are little stones there, which are called medricio, medri, medriosi, which eagles are often accustomed to carry to our parts. Though with 
through which or through which they regain their youth and restore sight. Uh, so the eagles carry these stones, this midriosi, from the fountain, and they use those stones to regain their youth and restore sight. If any one wears one on his finger, sight does not fail him. So we're talking magic stones, man. And if it is already impaired, it is restored. And the more he sees, the more his sight is sharpened. Blessed be the proper charm. It renders a man invisible. Is it play play? You think there's a stone charm that can render a naga invisible? Can dispel hatred, create harmony, and drive out envy? You know we need that because it's a more and more war. We should dump a bunch of these. Nah, no, we shouldn't because then they're going to become invisible. <laughs> and now we got a, a deeper problem, man. Let's, let's, let's keep the stones. Let's keep the stones, man. I do want to create harmony, though, and I want to drive out that envy of these envious, covetous nagas, man. But we're talking about the farthest parts of the world. The third India, this is the land of the press. This is America, man. This is America. Towards the south, we have a certain great and uninhabitable island <laughs> of which all the time a wa rains manna most abundantly twice a week. So you got the Israelites getting the manna in the, in the Bible, right? And then you got the manna raining down in the land of Preston John which is collected and eaten by the people who live nearby and they do not feed on any other food. Indeed, they do not plow, sow, or reap, nor do they disturb the land in any way to gain the most fertile fruit from it. All they eat is manna. In fact, this manna tastes in their mouths the same as it tasted in the mouths of the sons of Israel on their departure from Egypt. This is coming out the letter of Preston John. <laughs> He's saying they're eating over here and they don't have to do nothing but eat because it's, it's like paradise. <laughs> it tastes the same as the Israelites got it in Egypt. In fact, these men know no woman except their wives. They do not have envy or hatred. They live peacefully. They don't quarrel amongst themselves for their own sake and they do not have a mayor above them except the one that we send to receive our tribute in fact for tribute they pay every year to our majesty 50 elephants and as many hippopotami and these are loaded with purest balsam and as many are loaded with precious stones and fine gold king david you know he gets these type of tributes you know what i'm saying <laughs> President John gets the king of the world. Certainly the men of that land abound in precious stones and the yellowest gold. These men who live that who live thus in heavenly nourishment, each live for 500 years. But even so, they regain 100 years of life. And they are all renewed by drinking three times from the certain fountain of youth, my God, which flows out towards the base of a certain tree. You're talking Mount Rhyme? <laughs> yeah, namely on the Afrasad Island. You think it's play play, man? You think it's play play? I mean, you know, I'm just <laughs> skipping ahead. Because, you know, we've been talking everything else, giants and one-eyed centaurs. And you just heard the fountain of you flow. Now connect the press to, you know, I, I had to go through the whole Tacom say flow just to let you know that the Israelites are still fighting, right? And then Columbus is looking for the promised land, right? And press John is already over here, God. And it's connected with Sylvanus Tall Texas and Sylvanus Bravo and Kalelus.
All this is the indigenous truth. You won't get it in no public schools. And, you know, they can't give you this power to know that in the kingdom of America, you have a what? Cavern of dragons, just like they do in How to Train Your Dragon. It's going to sound just like in that cartoon, man. The animation flow. There is towards the south in that region a certain place of ours at which the world ends. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, boss. Hmm. Hold up. We're just talking about the world ending. It's reminding me of that, uh, that Tara Sancta flow. Let's follow this. We're just talking Presto John. This will be the farthest India. And even though we stuck in here, not seeing what's over here, we just thinking it's North America, South America. We ain't thinking about Tarzanta and all these lands. We had a little ice age, froze it out from our memory, froze it out from our consciousness. We were put in a spell, a Ruach Tardy Ma. But I, now I'm just talking the Cavern of Dragons and the Letter of the Presta and the Presta John legend and its sources. Ahab Aqua Taibatza. So, a place where the world ends, right? Will be like Tar de Fuego because they don't even, you know, they're not representing this on their maps, right? You don't see no Tar Fuego. The world has ended to them, right? The Moroccan Empire is ended right here. <laughs> the world ends, right? Okay. You don't see no Israel, no Holy Land, no Tarazant. So let's follow to this ending. Towards the south of that region, a certain place of ours at which the world ends, which is called the Cavern of Dragons. It is long and wide excessively difficult and the most severe and severity and difficult with the deepness and depth that is most deep and most cavernly and full of secret places. Where's our dragons, man? Why are they calling this... Uh... Why do they keep calling this Terra Fuego, man? Land of fire. So you're calling it the land of fire. Press is talking about a place where the world ends. Tavern of dragons. Cav Cavern of dragons. You say, but yeah, that's Terra de Fuego. It's nothing but ice. And I'm like, nah. <laughs> Nah, man. And if you keep going over from here, you know, you're running right into Tara Sancta. And who knows what cavernly spots we're talking about, right? Under, inside, you know, inside the mountains and, you know, inside this, through the gateways, the waterways, we don't know. We're just talking holy land, and we're just talking Israel, and we're just talking the king of Israel, right? We're talking the Prester, which means we're talking Tara Sant.
en Terra Fuego or Tar Sant. It is long and wide, excessively difficult and most severe in severity and difficult with the deepness and depth that is most deep and most cavernly and full of secret places. Indeed, in this place, there are infinite thousands of terrible dragons, ferocious dragons, infinite thousands. Imagine when Hawa says these dragons are loose. This is the worst fear that I jack. Anaga, this is their devil. <laughs> they call these devils, man, because they know these beautiful uh, infinite thousands of dracons are going to get that payback. Which the residents of those surrounding provinces guard with the greatest diligence, lest any wizards from India or elsewhere are able to steal one of those dragons. They trying to steal our dragons. You know who that is. You know who that is. For in fact, the princes of the Indians, the Khans of America, Managa, are accustomed to having dragons at weddings. Managa? <laughs> and at banquets of theirs. Man, I just need you to pause, man. Just take a pause, man. Just talking press to John. Installment number 90. It's part 90. Fall back. So we got this. I mean, we're just putting it together with this Tara Sant or Israel, or Holy Land. Outside of South America, these are vortexes you know is connecting to this North America so-called Four Corners. Grand Canyon. What does the Grand Canyon got to do with Tar Sant? Do you think there's no connection? All these lands connect, so of course there's connection. We just popping off, man. That's all it is. We just popping off. That's all. So outside of a maxim, there's a whole nother world. It's pretty much. And here's a sneak peek at it, right? <clears throat> here's a sneak peek at what's popping off. But, you know, it's a whole nother world. More worlds, right? Beyond the. Suppose Paul points, Admiral Byrd is finding more land. Of course, of course you are. Yeah, we're gonna get back on that flat drop. Let's keep reading. Thousands of dragons, infinite thousands. That's millions and millions and millions of fire breathing dragons, man. For in fact, the princes of the Indians are accustomed to having dragons at weddings and at banquets. Without dragons, they do not consider the banquet to be complete. And just as cattle and mule herders are accustomed to humble and humanize the horses young, to teach them and tame them and to call them by their own names, to place brittle and saddle on them and to ride them wherever they wish, so too these men who have custody and command of the dragons, the dragon commanders, humble the same dragons by their incantations and magics. We're talking magi. Humanize them, teach them, subdue them, and call them by their own names. Place brittle and saddle on them, and they ride these dragons whenever and wherever they wish. This is the letter of Prester John. Every year, these dragon peoples release to our magnificence for tribute 100 men, dragon masters, and 100 dragons humanized in this way, which are like cows amongst these men. And when the men play with them admirably by leading them here and there by the head and tail, 
They playing with the dragons with pulling their tail around. <laughs> the hijack afraid. These people are playing with their dragons, pulling them by their tail. The dragons are like dogs. Oh, we talking dogs again. Like dogs, not dogs, but they're like, they're playful, right? They're being playful like dogs, right? Not to everybody, <laughs> but to these dragon masters, right? They are like dogs. Truly, these men with their dragons are our couriers. And when it pleases our clemency, desiring to know all the news from every part, we send them with those dragons flying through the air, through every climate of the world. That's how they got the letter of Presa John in every language everywhere. That's how we was getting around, my naga. Wasn't no American Airlines. Wasn't no, no uh, Air Force. Revolution, the American Revolutionary War supposedly didn't have no Air Force, but we have read, love to miss D in the copper color awakening, that they had dragons during the American Revolutionary War. That they were breeding dragons. And of course they were. Because there's infinite thousands of dragons, my life. And they were going through every climate of the world. You know who you are, man. You just think you're some Indian. You just think you're some Israelite. You need to put it all together. You are the Khan. And who or who is Preston John? Cavern of Dragons. Yeah. They say they're like dogs, right? We got Fountain of Youth. Infinite thousands of dragons popping off. We got Terra Fuego happening in real time. They want to call it Antarctica today. Yeah, I get this drop because, you know, we're skipping a lot, but it's a lot for you to recon. And like they said, they had dog headed me. <laughs> Let's focus on this dog headedness for a minute and we'll get to making the best dismount of all time. <sighs> so we know there's something going on with Terra Santa, with Antarctica. We know there's something going on with Terra de Fuego, right? Ice Age connected to the more and more war. Connected to a curse by the chief of the lost tribes of Israel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we've been researching the Israel Indian connection. Love to George Jones, who says, hey, this Tecumse is an ancient Israelite. And that the Amaro Khan, the copper color races, are the true Americans following Prester John, according to the races of men, right? <laughs> that the copper Indians, that is the true Americans, were the lost tribes of Israel, headed by Prester John, and Columbus is looking for the Grand Khan, looking for Mount Zion. So put all this together with Tarzan, they're not going to show you all the land, man. They're not going to show us what's really popping off before this ice age. Okay. We over here kicking it in India Superior. <laughs> we over here defeating giants, man, way back in the 700s, man. We got the Sylvanuses popping off, the Ogams, the legendary home of the Ogre which I believe that they refer to the old man. But it continues. 
Mar Joseph's grandson Nathan had traveled to America with his kinsman Nathaniel Bartholomew or Bartholomew. Nathaniel was a grandson of Sylvanus Ogam, the Hebrew ruler of Kalelus. Solomon II, Ben Nathan the I, Zezus, Zesutra, was succeeded by a Babylonian exilarch as a Babylonian, Babylonian exilarch by his son Nathan II, Ukpa, as ruler of Subarset. And the Ten Mines by his son Mar Cunha, the father of Mar Joseph of Arimathea as ruler of Kalelus by his son, Mar Ptolemy, Ha Barber, the father of St. Bartholomew. St. Bartholomew is remembered in America as Quetzalcoatl, the white bearded priest. <laughs> well, sometimes they say, oh, the blonde hair, blue eyes. <laughs> like, stop it, man. Stop it, man. Whoa. They just dropped one, no. They just dropped something. We didn't look into St. Bartholomew like that. But we looked into Joshua like that. In the book of the beginnings, connecting Joshua with Kitsukoto in America. Is this Mar Ptolemy Ha Barbar? The father of Joshua, who's the son of Nu? who's also connected with this kids of Coatl. This might be another hard hit for the Joshua flow, but we might save it for press at 91. His son, Eliud Hadbabar, was the father of Sylvanus Tome, the ruler of Atala, or America, almost like Atlantis. <laughs> Uh-oh, boss. And the Lord Master, or Baal, of Anhoa, Anu, Mexico, and Kalelus, North America. So they're calling Anu, just like the Inky flow, right? <laughs> Anu Hawak. Anahawak is Mexico, Kalelus, North America, Atlanta. <laughs> Atala is America. Or oh, America, Kalelus, North America. Okay. And the Lord Master Baal of and Hawa. So Sylvanus Ptolemy, the ruler of Atla, or his son Eliwed Han Barbar, was the father of Sylvanus and Lord Master Baal. So they're just saying Lord Master. You know, Baal is a title, of course. So they're just saying he's the master of Mexico. <laughs> Skip all the hijack. All right. He's the ruler of America. He's the ruler of North America, Kalelus, and the master of Mexico, or and Hawak. Got it, got it. On Nehemiah Theodorus' return to the Frankish Roman Empire in 779, he left his brother at the, as the Hebrew ruler of Septimania, and he became the Hebrew ruler of the German lands of Bavaria and Saxony. My this is 779. This ain't even 900 yet. This ain't even 900 yet, okay? <laughs> How does this connect with the tribe of Israel? It's been connecting the whole time with Sylvanus, so Texas, Solomon, the builder. Dawi, these Davidic princes. I know I said we're going to talk dog heads. I'm getting to the dog heads right now. <laughs> it's coming up. <laughs> So he left his brother as the ruler of Septimania. Right. His son, Isaac, also called William of Gelon, later in life with his wife, became Catholic. So we're just still talking Cathay. And he is remembered as St. William of Gelon. He has been confused with his uncle, Nathan Kalanomius, who was also known as William of Galon or Telus, shout out to the bro, Telus, everything, who was involved in fighting the Muslims, right? Because this is what it was. This ain't nothing new. <laughs> These holy mountains, Morocco, Muhammad, and Mecca. 
but you got to know that we weren't over here chilling while this happened. You've you been fighting it. It's been a more and more war. You've been fighting them harmonics. Say William Isaac of Gideon in Toulouse as a new Christian monk went to visit his brother Israel the first of Kalelus. All right, here we go. So they just dropped kids of Kowoto out of nowhere on you, right? But all that is connected to the same tribes. Israel the first of Kalelus, brother of St. William. All right, it says he converted him to his <laughs> converted him to his mythical a Jewish brand of Catholicism. Come on, man. What do you what does it mean? What does it mean to be converted to their mythical Jewish brand of Catholicism? Man, mythical Jewish brand. So they got the Kabbalah, they got all the oh, we're just talking magis, man. Talking Israel the first <laughs> is a mystical magi, my God as practiced by the royal and noble families of Western Europe. Israel the first had become the king of Kalelus in 785 AD on the, and this is all happening before all this pilgrim and all oh, the pilgrims who came to visit the Indians in America. There's a whole kingdom of Kalelus being popping off here. That story don't make no sense. It does make sense that you did treaties with other Nagas over here that use their incantation and their harmonics to help take down Israel. King of Kalelus, the Preston, the priest. 785 on the death of his father-in-law, Jacob. In 800, Isaac Kalanomis and his two converted brothers, Benjamin and Judah, here we go, <laughs> went to reinforce the colony with 700 soldiers. Israel the first and many of the people embraced Catholicism under the teaching of the three conversal brothers of the Makiri dynasty, Magnavara. So again, they kept calling it a Jewish brand of Catholicism. So... You got to dodge all hijacks about their converts and stuff. Just follow the lineage, man. Don't get distracted because Cathay is Cathay. Cathayism or Cathay. Israel the first established his brothers as high priest of Kalelus. From the time, from this time, Kalelus becomes a Hebrew Cathay state with the ritual and spirituality derived from both Hebrew and Cathay sources, right? Israel the first Goriat, G-U-R-I-A-T, reigned for 67 years. So Israel the first, bodies on bodies, reigned for 67 years until 852, when he was succeeded by his son, Israel the second. This is in America. Not Tara Sancta, Palestine over there, man. I. Israel here. William, St. William Isaac of Gilon was two years in America, which was also known as the Isles of Barzil or Brazil. But it was the Isles of Barzil, iron. And from this time, he also was known as Barzelie or Barzile or Brazil. Then you continue with the Israel the second lineage, these Makaris. All the way to Israel the fourth in them, man. <laughs> I'm just going quick now, but you got the drop. Israel the three went south to the Toltec lands of Mexico and his grandson, Makir Amarik, or in the Welsh genealogies, is Mexico too, man. So you can't talk indigenous Naga history without talking the Toltecs, the, Toltec, the Aztecs, the Almex, Mexico, to Mexico, to Mexi. And you can't talk that without talking Israel the third, who's coming right out of Sylvanus, Toltecs, and then Kalelus, the Royals, Swanites, Barbers. 
and Israel the third is Mexico too. <laughs> and his grandfather, or he's the grandfather of Tapu Zain, who's also known as Israel the seventh, who's the priest of Quetzalcoatl, which they just connected with St. Bartholomew, but you know, we have a, a real strong hit with this Joshua flow, you know what I'm saying? And you know, connecting that with the Moshe flow with Hawa, with Hawama. Love to uh Gerald Massey in the book of the beginnings, man. So back it up. Israel the third. <laughs> he goes to Mexico to the Toltec land. So to, the Toltec were already set up. His grandson is also America, Amerique. Oh no, America Vespucci. Americ is the grandson of Israel the third. Amarik is the grandson of Israel the third monarch. This is where you're getting your title, America. From Kalelus, your empire. Tapuzin, who is Israel the seventh, is the priest of Kitsakoado or Joshua who left Cholula for Rhoda, the Redlands, in 1000 AD, right? So we worked our way all the way to 1000. But all this Hebrew flow, letting you know who you've been fighting against the whole time. Fast forward that to the 1400s, Columbus is finding us, man, right? Then we go... <laughs> And we've been popping off Indian and Chicamagua wars the whole time against their treaties. The whole time. The whole time. All through the 1800s, you've been fighting. And we're about to talk Philippines, man. And the land of Ophir, man. Because it's all about the Hebrew flow and what they were still. They came over here to get more gold, to get that Ophir gold, man. That Ophir gold, right? So we worked our way from the 700s, the 800s, all the way to 1,000. Now it's looking like, you know, you got this either repeat process or, you know, this this whole press the flow coming about 200 years after this. I mean, the, the press, the letter we just read was dated 1165. So that's coming right with this connection. Fountain of youth, cavern of dragons. So kids of rejoined the remnant. Shout out to the remnant of the Rodans. Who he had led east and then back to Europe. Uh, and some of the Latin Hebrew wrote and settled in Northwest Spain, where they, <laughs> as trained warriors, they were welcomed in the fight to preserve the freedom of Northwest Spain from the more body bag, body bag for the illusion. They weren't walking around your cube, man. This is this is occurring way after this Kalelus, because this would not be popping off in the midst of Sylvanus to Texas. Kids of Coado and them, but they're putting it right here during the time they're making treaties on Tacomse and the Shikamagua. the chief of the Israelites, right? So you got a new exilarch at this time. This is your last exilarch, Monaga. This is the last Israelite leader that was tribing everyone up. And after he fell, everyone, you know, a lot of Monagas kept going, man, for a hundred years almost, like just kept fighting, you know what I'm saying? Kept fighting. When were you a, 
a homeborn slave? When did you just stay in slavery on some plantation, man? When you fought all these wars and specifically you were fighting to preserve the freedom from the Muslims, <laughs> from their Mohammed, Bahamut harmonics. Because you knew it would lead to an ice age, a plague. Rodrigo El Cid was Tapazine's great grandson. Tapazine's son was called Lane Calvo Lancelin. Then I just tell you this Lancelot, King Arthur is coming right out of your royal Davidic house. David, not Arthur, David, Davidic. Lancelin is Lancelot of Kalelus, which is Camelot, my naga. Rodrigo El Cid and his father, Diego Lane, or Jacob, married into the Davidic exilic family of Spain, right? Barcelona and Est. His daughter, Maria Rodriguez. Rodriguez is the Roda. They're getting Rodriguez from Rodans. This ain't no just oh, Spanish situation. This is a Kalelu situation. This is a Roda situation. These Rodriguez's. First wife of Raymond Beringer, Beringer, the fourth Arnold Count of Barcelona. So descended in the male line from Guilbilin, who is Gul Abarik, Balan, Yakar, Ben Judah. All these fancy titles, we still talk in Judah in Spain, Judah in America, Sylvanus to Texas. Narbon, the youngest son of Makir Todrosa Sepermania. Lane Calvo's sister Shamina of Kalelus married Fernand Nunez of the Counts of Amaya family. Some genealogists have confused the ancestors of the family of the El Cid. The British Jewish rodent settled in Wales. Now that leads to the Prince Madoc, man, <laughs> which is way more drop, man. A series of pre-Columbian dressed stone fortifications built up the Alabama River. Man, now we back talking <laughs> about all this, uh, you know, Tacomsay flow, Chicamagua flow, Tennessee flow. How do we make it back here, right? So we're still talking Kalelus. King Israel the seventh of Kalelus. Look at the dates. Still talking America. Hey man, Presta said he uh, was surrounded. <laughs> you know, David said he's encompassed by my. I'm, I'm encompassed by my enemies, man. These hijacks is everywhere. <laughs> These hijacks is everywhere making treaties. You know, what's a naga to do? So not going to do when you got the hijack literally everywhere around you, man. This is the beginning of the book or collection of authoritative sayings, opinions, and prophecies concerning the need to recover the holy city in Mount Zion and discovery and conversion of the islands of the Indies and of all peoples. Don't Columbus also talk about finding him some dog heads? I'm just talking St. Christopher. Yeah, he reported on some dog headedness, some dog headed islands. I'm just talking, you know, you dog. They put it right in our face, ball. Love to the bro EC, man, who dropped this on us, man. Martyr Philo, Philopator, Philopator. And this Pator is this Pitor. This Pitor is Pator. 
like Jupiter. Oh, let's go. Let's get a piece of it. It says martyr Philopator, whose name is inter interpreted as lover of the father and also means servant of JC. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just talking about St. Mercurius. So when one tribe is worshiping Mercury over here and another tribe is worshiping the servant of JC, you know, <laughs> you see that there's clearly a connection. This is why they're coming out saying, oh, yeah, we are the Moroccan Catholics. Right? It all comes together. The JC goes hand in hand with the Mercurius. The Mercurius goes hand in hand with the with the Thoth and the Baphomet and the Muhammad, all right? Angel Gabriel, all that, right? So it's all the same. The holy man was a native of the city of Asletis, Asletis. Uh, like As, you know, I was bringing it right there, right? Which was also the city of his father and his grandfather who born were born therein and he was brought up in the city of Rome, now the occupation of his father and grandfather and kinsmen was that of hunters and wild beasts. One day they were out hunting according to their custom and they found two men with faces of dogs. And they ate his father and they also wanted to eat. They ate his grandfather and they also wanted to eat his father, but the angel of the law, uh-oh, prevented them from doing so. The angel said unto him, touch him not, for from him shall go forth good fruit. Then the angel of the Lord surrounded them with fire, and being in tribulation, the two dog faces came to the father of St. Mercurius. The dog-headed Nagas <laughs> came to the father of St. Mercury, right? And they bowed low before him. So now these dogs are worshiping the father of St. Mercury. Because from him is coming forth good fruit. I guess that's Mercury. So they know they got to serve Thoth, right? They got to serve Thoth like Anubis, right? They got to serve Thoth. They know Thoth is coming through this dude. So they bow low. Straightway, God changed their savage name. We're not talking our creator, you know. <laughs> We're talking their dog, right? D-O-G-G-O-D. D-O-G. Changed their savage nature to one of the gentleness of gentleness. We're just talking whites, man, demon monsters, man. <laughs> just talking whites. They're bringing up this JC story. This reminds me of this new test, uh, Matthew such and such, where he was uh, talking about, uh, let's see, let's just put it in, man. Uh, Jesus, dog, you know. Dog verse, yeah. <laughs> Was it dog? Where's the Jesus dog verse? Matthew 15. <laughs> dog verse. Man, this is called the dog verse. Let's talk about it. So this JC is going around. He's 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 doing some miracles. He gets he gets uh you know jammed up by this Canaanite woman, right? Now the Canaanite woman is the canine, right? She's already the dog head, right? She's already a part of the dog head tribes. I need to I need to get this, man. This is crazy. All right. Just for resource purposes. <laughs> Research purpose. Then JC, verse 21, went thrice, went went thence, departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon, 
And behold, a woman of Cana, Canaan, Canine, right? So imagine just this is a dog headed woman, right? This is Canine, let's put it together. So the dog headed woman came out <laughs> from the same coast and cried to him, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. Now, why has he got to be the son of David? Because he has to claim the title and the heritage of Dawi, even though he's an immaculate conception. So how could you be the son of David if you're an immaculate conception? But that's just another body bag for the illusion. You don't have a father, right? You know, you have a divine, spirited, immaculate conception. How could you be from the loins of King David? I'll wait. You just jacking the titles. So this dog head, woman of Canaan, she tells JC, just call him Zeus, because you're talking Jesus, you know. She tells Zeus, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and said, hey, man, get away, man. For, you know, get her away. She's crying after us. But he said, look, I'm not sent, but into the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So even in their phantom duplication, the Christian still doesn't even read this. <laughs> that it's still about the house of Israel, but they don't care. You know, they're, they're spiritual Israel, you know. Their JC only came for Israel, but they're spiritual Israel. But let's go. Then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he said, it is not meat to take the children's bread, Israel, and cast it to the dogs, right? <laughs> I can't make this stuff up. Now, did she say, oh, I'm offended you called me a dog headed? I know I'm a woman of the canine. I know I'm a canine woman. How dare you call me a dog? How dare you call my people dogs? Was she offended? No, nah, she said truth. <laughs> this is true. No, nah, this don't make sense in any other way. That anybody would be called a dog by JC. And that's cool, right? He's the nicest guy to ever <laughs> walk. He's calling this woman a dog and she didn't even do nothing to him. He's just acknowledging what it is. I can't take something, a blessing, a higher blessing and give it to the dog heads. I can't even take Zeus's blessing and do that. <laughs> and she said, truth, I am a dog. <laughs> Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which falls from the master's table. I am a dog. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs that come from the master's table. You put it together. I'm out of here, man. So that's all I have for this new text. <laughs> We're talking dog heads. You know, he's coming just for Israel, but the Christian, you know, is all about the Gentile, right? <laughs> yeah, he's the son of David, but he's an immaculate conception. I mean, it's just so many things wrong with this, but the dogs know their dogs. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs of the master's table. And, and Zeus answered and said, hey, woman, hey, great is your faith because you know you're a dog. Be it unto you even as you will. And the daughter was healed. The daughter was healed. Now, was the daughter healed of her dog headedness? Maybe she had syphilis, man. You know, sinus of phallus, you know. <laughs> well, she's a dog, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, this is JC's experience, experience with the dogs, man. I think that's very interesting to know because you're just talking dog heads. So these dog heads started worshiping Mercury. The dog faces lived with them for many days. Straight away, their power changed their savage nature 
to one of gentleness. So the dog head was transformed into gentleness, kind of like Christopher Columbus, kind of like Saint Christopher. The dog head, right? Who also got his vestige transformed. We're talking all these Christian saints, and you don't think this is Christopher? We're talking Christ of Ophir. Christopher is a title for the anointed of Ophir. We're going to talk Ophir in the Philippines today. His name ain't Christopher. He's the Christ of Ophir. <laughs> and he's a, he's a dog head. And they gave us a new story. 1200 years later for Christopher Columbus, who dies of gout or syphilis or sinusophilus, dog headedness. They say gout. Christopher becomes the Christ bearer. Christopher. Columbus. Christopher was a giant named Reprobus. So now we got another giant outcast from where? Canaan. Whoa. We just got the Canaanite woman, right? With JC, who knows she's a dog, standing over seven feet tall. 12 feet, according to Jacobus, he was in the service of a Canaanite king. Dog headedness. One day he saw the king make a sign of the cross every time a gesture mentioned the devil, deciding, deciding this meant the devil was more powerful and went in search of him. I seek to serve the devil as a master is what Reprobus St. Christopher dog-headed said. And then they were traveling down the road to the wayside, it came upon a wayside cross, and the demon was so struck with terror that he took a long detour to avoid it. Christopher demanded to know why, and the demon told him about Christ or Zeus and how his sign filled him with fear. So Christopher went in search of Zeus and finally found a hermit who preached the faith to him. And because of that, <laughs> hold up, man, this is crazy. So one day while in his hut, he heard the voice of a child calling him, Christopher, come out and carry me across. Carry me a cross, God. He lifted the boy on his shoulders, but as he got partway into the river, the child grew unbearably heavy. Oh, that cross grew heavy. <laughs> Almost crushing and dragging him under the water, only with great effort did he finally make it across. Weary and surprised, he said to the child, you put me in great danger. It was as though I had the weight of the whole world on my shoulder. The child replied, do not be surprised, for not only did you carry the whole world, but he who created it, I am Christ, your king. Now, St. Christopher, we, we had to look up dog-headedness, because if we didn't look up dog-headedness, you know what they would have gave us, man? This BS story right here. Take off the dog head. You would have got this. Oh, St. Christopher. No dog headedness. He's all good. Look at him. He's perfect. He's just carrying the Christ child. Look at him. Right? Just like this, just like the dog head, right? Carry me across. This child is calling him. He's carrying a Christ child, right? 
venerated by several Christian denominations as a martyr killed in the reign of the third century Roman Emperor Decius. Famous legend tells he carried a child who was unknown to him across a river before the child revealed himself as Christ. Same person. He is the patron saint of travelers. Christopher Columbus, Christ of Ophir. Because they're coming for the gold. And when he found America, he became the anointed of the gold, the anointed of the land of gold, the anointed of the cities of gold, like Esteban Nico. Was Esteban the child he carried? St. Stephen? Is that who he carried? I'm just showing you, like, they don't say nothing about dog hair. We had to recall that separately to find the same story. So this Christ, how many Christ are there, man? This Christ is carried by a dog-headed nigga. <laughs> Plant your staff in the ground by your hut, it will, and it will leaf and bear fruit. With that, the child vanished, and Christopher, as he was told, did as he was told. The next morning, the staff bore leaves and the fruit like a palm. <sighs> It means the person of Christopher who emerged in the popular medieval cult has only a passing relation to a historical figure named Christopher who died a martyr's death. His death is what made him a saint, like St. Stephen, Esteban. His legend is what made him a teaching tool. Yeah, man. What's peculiar is that in some Eastern icons, Christopher is depicted with the head of a dog. This is commonly attributed to a linguistic error. Really? <laughs> Christopher was a Canaanite, which in Latin is Canaeus. Canaeus. Change one letter of the Latin, you get Canaeus or Canaanite or dog man or dog headed man. Was it an error, Managa? Was it an error? We're just talking sinus of phyla. They pretend that they have in their camps sinus of phyla, that is, man with the dog heads. This is what Paul the deacon is writing. Dog head man. Paul's talking about it. They spread the rumor among the enemy that these men wage war obstinately, drinking human blood and quaff their own gore if they cannot reach the foe. Sinus of phyla. The people are without a king and are idolaters and are no better than wild beasts. Canaeus. <laughs> Anaga, we're talking dog headed Nagas, man. Of course, you got uh, Anubis, right? The Egyptian guy that was, he had his dog head in this. So, you know, a part of the story talks about how his face, you know, was changed. You know what I'm saying? And this is why they have him kind of as a, as both. You know what I'm saying? He was this. The Christ child changed him to this. Go back here with this mercurial situation, this saint over here. See the connection. Straightway, God changed their savage natures to one of gentleness, and they became like sheep and went with him to the city. And after he begotten the holy man Mercurius and called his name Philopator, the dog faces lived with them for many days, and then they became Christians, and then they became Christians, and then they became Christians. And then they became Christians. And I, I can't make this stuff up, man. The facts sometimes seem stranger than fiction. And then they became Christians.
carrying the Christ child, St. Christopher. Look at him, man. And then they became Christians. You think all these paintings are for no reason? And then they became Christians. When the scripture is talking about jackals, we're talking about dog-headed tribes. Your land becoming a land of jackals. We're talking about these dog heads taking over. Now the ancestors of the holy man have become in days old, in days of old pagans. When they received the gift of Christian baptism, they called the further father of the holy man Noah. Wow. And his mother Taba and Philippator Mercurius, the dog faces according to what the angel of the Lord said unto them when he appeared unto them were in subjection to Mercury, which is Thoth, man, which is the angel Gabriel in the Quran that's visiting Muhammad. There's two Gabriels, there's two Enochs, there's duplicity. We got to dodge all hijacks. Ask his father of St. Mercury to entreat God to remove from them their savage nature and to make them to possess the nature of man. So they're walking around you today looking like you. Looking just like you. And God changed their nature and they became like men. Now they're controlling the armies. <laughs> now they're in Rome. They were starting to see a lot of things clearly, man. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Yeah, we're going to take our time with this next time. You know, I'm just coming back to it, man, but... I'm just belly flopping, man. About one month after those, this those men who had journeyed to Mecca arrived, and all the Muslims who were there with their kinsmen went out to meet them. The judge, the father, and the young men met the friend who wept bitterly, and he told the judge how his son had stayed behind in the desert <laughs> and how they had left him and come on. When his father heard this, he rent his garments, and his brethren and young men also rent their garments, and they sat down and mourned for three days. And after this, a certain Muslim woman saw the young man who had become a Christian coming out the church of St. Mercurius. And a Muslim went and told his father and his brethren this and said to him, if it were not that your son died in the desert of Mecca Road, I should be inclined to say that the young man whom I saw this day by the church of St. Mercurius, the martyr, was he. He was wearing the white apparel with the monks where in the truth and in truth he was like your son so he's just popping up all over the place mercurius when the father and the mother and bread and the young man heard this they rose up and went there and found him and they seized him and said to him what have you done and why have you put me to shame among the muslim nobles and he said to them i am a christian and i believe in our lord jc the son of the living god the most high so he's the most high, the JC, JC, <laughs> blessed be his name. Immediately he had said this, they punished him very severely and they cast him into a dark pit and he remained there for seven days and seven nights. So he's just being persecuted because he want to be a Christian, this Mercurius. And he becomes a martyr. This is their story. These are their saints. This is who they're worshiping. Mercury, who wants to be a Christian, right? Mercury, who wants to, you know, be down with the son of Zeus or with Zeus because Mercury <laughs> and, you know, Saturn and Jupiter, all this is rocking together. Con. <laughs> so, are you talking Jupiter and JC or you're talking Mercury? You're talking the sons of Saturn. 
you talk talking Apollo, which means you're talking Sinus of Phallus. We're going to touch back on that St. Stephen as well, but, you know, again, you know, I wanted to get on this China, this China flow and the OASPI. We got a few more minutes, but look, man. When they talk, they're Christ. All right, we know we got our mama wisdom, but they hijack that with their Christ, right? Knowledge, education after the false God. When they talk Christians, they're talking about a brotherhood of warriors that were named Christians in mocking derision by the Hebrews. One who rushes into a multitude of riders and with the sword enforces peace is a true Christian. With the sword. That's a true Christian, huh? False God is what's connecting with their Christ. And we have some deliverers. We have some Mashiachs. And a lot of times it seems like they're all the same when it comes to this China. C-H-I-N-E or A, a deliverer, a man of China. Okay, he's contemporaneous with Moshe. He's living at the same time as Moses. So when we get back on our China flow, we're just still talking Moses and who they call Kapilia, who now, now he's in India. So you got one in India, one coming out of Egypt. <laughs> You know, in one uh, in China, you got China, you got Egypt, you got India, and they're all one person split into three different stories. He was to China, a great deliverer, Isu by birth. It means like prophet, pure, wrought miracles. The country China was named after him. Named by him after himself. After his death, his body was reduced to ashes, and Jehovah or Hawa caused the wind to gather up the ashes and restore China to life for seven days, during which time he preached before the kings and the people. Then Hawa sent down a ship of light. <laughs> And bore China up to heaven, just like Ezekiel in the chariot of fire. <laughs> yeah, I mean. So they got a whole chapter on China. And it's just a good place to pick it up. Again, you know, you got to dodge all hijacks at all costs. <laughs> um, you know. There's a lot of hijack, false godisms, but there's also some clarity as well that you can get out of this once you got your mind right, man. Once you got your mind right. They pop off first into Capilia, you know, it says being the history of Capilia, Moses, and China. The three great leaders, fourth of the faithists, in the time of Lika, son of Jehovah, as the upper book is in the heavens, so is the lower book chiefly of earthly affairs in the administration of God. So like I said, you know, dodge all hijacks. We came back, you know, around here to the OASP at the right time. You know, the code keepers are, you know, focused, so we ain't got to be confused. But, you know, we're going to go back through with the Capilia flow. You know, I'm just belly flopping in the China flow. And really, it's all the same. I mean, one is cutting through India, you know, delivering his people. You know, some minor variations in the story. But for the most part, it's all about saving the tribes of Israel. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to leave this document. I mean, you know, it's about a thousand pages. Like I said, take your time and, you know, search it out. You know, some people just, you know, dig on this super heavy. But, 
you know, without balance, you know, you get into a whole nother spectacle. I've learned to keep things M-H-O-E around here, man. It always leads me to the simple path. All right, so now we're, I'm just belly flopping. They're talking Moses. First, they're talking Capilia. I'm looking for the China flow coming right in hot. And, you know, we got to take our time with all this. Now they go into China. So these are the generations of the seven antecedents of China, or we're just talking descendants, antedescendants, the chosen of the great spirit. All right, so again, we dodge all these other titles and stuff they try to throw away. Right. And it goes into the lineage, you know, the Si Wong beget Ha Gan, Hai Gan beget Ha So, you know, they, they're breaking down the lineage like they would with China or anyone else. Just belly flopping. All right, let's just belly flop right here. You know, we're headed towards a dismount. We got somewhere to pick up for next time. Impressed to 91. Let's get them to drop. China said, I am a man only. I am the all light. My voice is that that lives forever. Worship me not. <laughs> worship not man. So automatically you're getting someone who's saying, don't worship me. Don't praise me. Only worship the creator, right? Wow. So China said, I am man only. I am the all light. My voice is that that lives forever. Worship not me. Worship not man. He says to worship all light. I am Jehovah. We're talking Hawa, ever present because of my abundance in man. So now it's switched up. It's talking through the words of Jehovah, or I would assume they're all talking to creator, but, you know, I'm going to say creator, you know, because just to, you know, you got to walk this way. <laughs> you got to walk this path through a Wasby, man. <laughs> so I am the creator, ever present because my abundance in man, man opens the mouth, makes words to know me is to know all things. He who strives to me is my chosen. He who knows me not or knows not me, proves not me. He who knows me cannot prove me. To every self, I am the self of that self. To perfect that self, which is in all selves, such a man is one with me. To travel on such a road, that is the right road. Here, old man, I come every 3,000 years, okay? I, I newly light up the world. My voice comes upon the souls of men. They all, the, uh, thy all highest is me. Thy all lowest is sin. Two things only set I before thee, O oh man. The self that is myself and the self that is thyself, which will you serve for Hereon hangs either your resurrection or your hell. In the time of the first of ancients, I asked the same question. Whoso said, I will serve you. They keep using this title, you know, referring to their Jehovah or Allah, or I'll just say the most high. <laughs> Thou all self, he was my chosen. Whoso answered, I will serve the self of myself was Satan's. The latter went on the wrong road. Their trail was blood and death, war, their glory. They fell upon my chosen like tigers. They have pursued them. I called out in the ancient days, why persecute you, my chosen, and destroy them? They answered, they will not war. They serve not our king. They serve the king of kings. They practice peace. They uphold not our God which reminds me of a little bit of that sign as a father's Apollo flow because Apollo cursed these Atlanteans with the dog head in this because they would not serve Apollo. They wanted to serve the king, Alcathus. So because they chose the king over Apollo, he cursed them with dog head in this called Sinus Cephalus. 
All right, all right. Like I said, we're gonna take our time with I'm just, you know, digging on what's happening with China. Digging on chapter 23 in the OSB, all right, it's page 699. China spoke Jehovah's words or the Most High's words saying, they have sought after pleasure and after thee, O earth, they have bowed down to men, to the king and to rich men. And now, behold their misery, the king said, come serve me, take your spear and your strong bow and arrow and come with me and I will show thee great delights that shall thou shalt slaughter my enemies and I will give you wages. And they ran to serve the king. Yeah, they washed their hands in the blood of my innocent ones. So all this is all about, you know, the innocent ones of, of this power that's being slaughtered. Good slaughterer. Then they were pleased, highly recompensed. I have said you are on the wrong road. Serve only me, for I am good delights, because you slay one another. More and more war, the land will not be tilled. Ice Age, <laughs> you are hungered and ragged, and they queried, What will Jehovah, what will the Most High get for wages more than the king? Herein is thy weakness, O man. You say, Wait a little while. I will serve the man first and after the Most High. What profit hast thou in your brother's death with all his treasures of gold and silver? What hast thou? Behold, even they that choose me in my ways, thou wilt not suffer to live in peace because they say my creator is my king and will I serve. The king says, go for them, slaughter them, they put a wah higher than me. And they said, it is a good, it is a good and wholesome thing to serve the king and kill his enemies, to serve my country by killing men. This is great glory. But the voice of my beloved rose up to me, my lambs fleeing before the wolves and driven away from the goodly pastures. Behold me. I am come to them, to the lovers of peace and virtue and loving kindness. My hand is stretched over them in great power. My word is given unto them and it's not dead. I will call them together and they shall again hold up their heads and rejoice because of my presence. And the most high voice came to China. He traveled far near and because of his wonderful wisdom, men of great learning and even kings sent for him. And wherever he went, he preached after the same manner for peace and love and against the war. After three years, China traveled, proclaiming the creator above all else in heaven and earth. And then he rested 140 days, sleeping like a young child saying nothing more than a child would say. Ain't that something? Kind of like Moshe, his eyes never being dim, never abated. Life force never reduced. <laughs> Sleeping like hibernation and suspended animation. 140 days, China. After proclaiming the creator above all, <laughs> Most high above all, M-H-A-A, five eyes, ma, we out of here, man. <laughs> Most high over everything, man, is all China talked about. <laughs> then came a change about China. He was as a new man in the world after 140 days and not as a God. And he rose up saying, my father, creative man, called me. I hear his voice. It is like a burning fire in my soul, moving me, not with pain, but with great power. He says, China, my son, China, my son, Kana, my heart is on fire. My little ones are burning. Go thou, China, to them. 
They are in fear and trembling. They know not what way to turn. The kings of the earth have outlawed them. Negro, <laughs> the Negroes are hurt, right? China's popping off. They are hunted down and are famished. Go thou to them, O China, for that end created I thee al alive in this world. For that end created I you. I created you for this. You are my voice unto them. All right, we're talking about creator, right? <sighs> creator above all, says China. That's all China's proclaiming. It's all China's popping off with. So, yeah, you know, he's contemporaneous, they said, right? He's living at the same time. <laughs> trying to tell these dog headedness trying to tell these dog heads to back back contempt oh man I can't type man <laughs> poor anius how you say that yeah definition what would they say Existing or occurring in the same period of time. Like Pythagoras was contemporaneous with Buddha. Managa, we just got that, uh, you know, Moshe is contemporaneous with China. Oh, yeah. I got all these links, man. I'm popping off, man. Oh, there we go. So China's popping off saying, hey, Hawa above everything, most high over everything. Contemporary, contemporary, contemporaneous. There we go, man. Existing at the same time. And I, at the same time as Moses and Capilli. So we'll be back on this. I'm just connecting it all, man. And this has a lot of flow, you know, sounding like the Atlantis flow, connected back with the dog headed flow to the St. Christopher flow, to the Columbus flow, to the, you know, Mount Zion flow. And we're just talking Christ of Ophir at the end of the day, right? For the dismount, my naga. At the end of the day, we're just talking Christ of Ophir. We connected our lands. Uh, I got this great book, man, we're going to get next time. The Lost Kingdom of Antioch, the Mystery of Ancient British Columbia. They call it an alternative history article on the history of British Columbia. You already know they dropping that drop, <laughs> alternative. They had to say that because they can't give up all this drop. They can't just give up all this drop. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, man. Just to show you the contents. They got the maps of the 1500s talking Annie Young. You know what I'm saying? Historical mysteries of British Columbia, you know, giving different people's take on things, man. This Captain Cook plays heavy, even in the Hawaii flow, Kamahamaha, <laughs> Kamaya, Kamaya. This, 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 this James Cook reminds me a lot of Captain James Kirk, you know, the Star Trek flow. He's going out of space. This Cook is going to outer space, right? More land more extra terror, right? Also reminds me of, you know, Captain Hook, you know, Peter Pan and, you know, this fountain of youth where Peter Pan is always staying young. So you got Captain Hook and Captain Kirk seem to be correlating around this James Cook situation. Something for us to dig on. But yeah, Albion. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, we got to blow these maps up. Get 
it's scarcely possible to exaggerate the importance of this information given as it was by actors in the scenes represented, many of whom have departed from this life and all of whom will soon be gone. To no small extent, it is early historical knowledge absolutely rescued from oblivion and which, if lost, no power on earth can reproduce. We're talking Ania. That's from uh, Hubert Howe Bancroft. Author Reed Ropes talking about it. In the limbo of imaginary exploration, there is perhaps no more important, minutely mapped, and at the same time, fantastically varying country than that which includes the famous kingdom or province of Ania, with still the more famous strait of the same name. Anion Kingdom, Anon Ben David. The history of the strait is remarkable enough to be worth setting down briefly, even though the proportion of fact of fiction in a narrative be of the slenderest. We're just talking Anion. <laughs> they say it means nature. Uh oh. Wow. Kingdom, dominion. The derivation of the word Anion is obscure, but it seems to have come from some name given to the extreme northeast part of Asia. Where is Asia? And this name has been vaguely ascribed to Marco Polo. That the title first appeared on the Asiatic side of the strait. Though it is afterwards settled on the other is almost certain for it is hardly credible that a map maker would put an entirely imaginary name to an entirely unknown part of the new continent really and if asiatic the name being applied to the northeast part of the china right moshe deliverer contemporaneous china emperor would almost Inevitably, inevitably be taken from Marco Polo, but the word Anion is nowhere mentioned in the Venetian or by the Venetian. By then, did this Anion Regnum, Anion Provicia, come to make its appearance on the map? So they don't know nothing. Anion is an island off the Chinese coast, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They said Asia, huh? They said Asia, huh? <laughs> A name given to the northeast part of Asia. Wow. We're going to get back on this Anion drive. I'm just introducing you to the flow. I just can't believe they just keep body bagging themselves, man. Time and time again, man. It's just getting out of control these days. The number of body bags. It's really hard to keep track of all these body bags, man. Because they're talking about it. We're talking about Prince Madai. We're talking about King Jacob. Which means we're talking about Kalelus. Makir Amarik. Amarka. Kitsukawaro. Lancelot of Kalelus. Yeah, I mean, it must be a part of Asia. And we keep saying the same thing, man. Where is Asia? <laughs> Where's Asia? Which one? If they say Northeast Asia, where's Northeast Asia? <laughs> you back in Antioch, huh? Okay. Dog headed Nagas. In our kingdom.
Everybody's writing about the press. <laughs> but this King David, a most powerful man, a knight, right? Swat knight, strenuous in arms, fiery in nature, and most victorious in battle, whom the Lord roused in our times to be the hammer of the pagans. Who's the pagans? And the exterminator of the pestilential tradition and detestable law of the faithless Muhammad. King David is the hammer of Muhammad. This is why they don't talk David. He ain't walking around no queue with you. He ain't doing no Moorish Moroccan treaties. He is the man whom the common people call Preston John, although he was the smallest of his brothers, as we have read of David, the prophet, the holy king of Israel. He was placed before all and crowned as king by divine inspiration. I'm talking David, the king of the Indians, man, who was called Preston John by the common people. David is the king of India superior. All three Indians, the Preston is the king of the world. And for the dismount, Manak. You know, we've been talking about Christ of Ophir. And they're connecting Ophir, you know, these Jewish traditions of Ophir. You know, connecting with this India subcontinent. I want to get back on the joke time drop for sure. The Philippines got their flow in Tomo the third. Pages 112 to 138 of the book Colision General de Documentos Relativos a los Ailes Filipinos Extensius en el Aquivio de Indias de Seville. I'm trying. Found in the archive, General Archive of the Indies in Spain, document number 98, describes how to locate the land of Ofer. Okay, the navigational guide started from the Cape of Good Hope in Africa to India, right, to Burma in Sumatra, to Malacca, to Borneo, to Sula, to China, and then finally Ofer, which is said to be the Philippines. So, you know, I'm just digging on my Filipino nagas because, you know, we've been digging on the Philippines, right? A better Philippines, positive news, right? The, <laughs> love to a uh, better Philippines.com, all right? So, or dot wordpress.com. The Philippines was the land of Ophir where King Solomon's gold used to build the temple came from. I make, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than golden wedge of Ophir, Isaiah 13. You know, so they're tracing a lot of flow, you know, into these Philippines, man. Remember? When we start digging on the Philippines, you know, we brought up some interesting stuff. Was this the right one? Let's see. I mean, <laughs> some real interesting pictures start coming out. Images of the past, stereotype of Filipino immigrants. Right. Confused. It says they are confused, man. They are popping off. <laughs> All right. So these Filipinos, man, it says, look, this is Uncle Sam holding a Filipino child. Now, we showed this before. So you already know what we're talking about. All right. We we're bringing all this together with this more and more war situation. Why? Because they've been at war uh, with the Filipino for a long time. Because after this, the Kumse War, Chicamago War, Texas Indian Wars, and all that, they go into Mexico and right into the Philippines. And you got to say, this is very strategic, 
right? After the Mexicans, they go right into the banana Philippines and then to the Vietnam flow, Cold War, Korean War, Vietnam, right? Now, what was so special in the Philippines that took 20 more years of fighting? Who are they rolling up on in the Philippines, Managa? All this is traces of these Israelites everywhere we go. This is what a Philippine is looking like, right? This is what a Philippine is looking like, right? Prince shows Philippine receiving the bath of civilization. He's getting baptized. Look at this nug. Look at this nug, right? Come. Huh. We're going to talk this nug. Come, mehameha. Say it with me. Come, mehameha. <laughs> it's more than just some comics and Dragon Ball Z's. You know, this is Kamehameha. You know, we're talking Philippines or we're talking Hawaii. We're talking Ofer. We're talking the lands of gold. The first mention of Ofer was in the book of Genesis chapter 10, right after the great flood of Noah, as the world has to be repopulated again. All nations come from the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, don't tell the hijack that not on there more. Moorish maps. Shem ain't even there, man. We, we don't have no Shem, all right? The sons of Shem are Elam, Asher, Arx, Arfaxed, Lud, Aram, and Arfaxed came Shelah, and Shelah was the father of Eber, the Hebrew race. Eberu. Eber has two sons, Peleg, headed west. Father of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Israel, right? Okay. All right. Okay. While the other groups of Hebrews came from Joktan, who was 13th child or settled towards the east. And three of them, Ophir, Sheba, and Havala, settled in a place described on islands of the sea. And we started connecting this Joktan with the seed of Ashur, you know what I'm saying? And we, you know, this, it was, you know, <laughs> This Nimrod flow, you know, seemed to be paralleling a lot, but Nimrod was getting credit for a lot of what I believe it was Ashur was building. And Joktan was coming out of that, and they were still coming out of Shem. All oh, this is still Shem, even though they tried to make it Ham and Cush. Ophir, Sheba, and Havalia are the sons of Joktan. These are still Hebrews. Settled in the place described in the islands of the sea, the, fo the focal point of our search for Ophir. First Kings chapter 9, verse 26, reveals Ophir as the biblical El Dorado. And King Solomon made a navy of ships in Ezram ben -Gur, which is beside Eloth on the shore of the Red Sea, the land of Edom. And Haram sent in the navy his servant shipmen that has knowledge of the sea with the servants of Solomon, and they came to Ophir and fetched from then, from thence gold, 420 talents, and brought it to King Solomon. So this is where King Solomon's, you know, temple gold was popping off out of, man. But we just read about King Solomon's navy, the ships of Solomon, the swan knights, the ships shaped like swans. Let's put it all Together, this context of verses was preparation of King Solomon to build the first Jerusalem. And we'll pick it up, you know what I mean? But this all is going to go right into, you know, how this is all connected with the Philippines. There is no doubt that the group of islands in front of China towards the sea is the present day Philippines. The question is, where was Ophir located in the Philippines? Ancient Chinese records say that the ancient trading places in the Philippines were Mai and Palulu. Take note, we have Pololio Island up to the present. Dr. Otle Bayer identifies Mai as Mandoro. Dr. Jose Rizzo, Blue, Mint Blue Mintrit Robertson and Strangle <laughs> says that it was Luzon in part or in whole. 
Menora Mendeora means mine of gold or gold mine. Could it be the biblical El Dorado? Well, we'll pick it up with this overflow, but we know we're talking Monogas, right? And what in the world were they coming at the Philippines for so hard? If not for more gold, right? More gold from the Naga, right? <laughs> more gold from the Naga, huh? This is another depiction. This is supposed to be Queen, the Queen of England or something. And she's holding, at this time, it just looks like 1890 or something. So the face of Cuba had already changed because you know the indigenous Cubans look just like the indigenous Philippines. But look at this Philippine uh, <laughs> and tell me that they weren't at war against you the whole time. Same as the Chicamagua and the, and the Mexico Mexicans and Texas Indians and the Seminoles and the Creeks and the same treaties that were against the Chicamagua and Tacoma say they were fighting in 1786 and all that. It's the same treaties on the head bone of the Philippine Nagas too. And here's the queen trying to hold on to everybody. Then you got the king of Hawaii who unites the Hawaiian Islands, another Naga king. They got different depictions of him and his family. And all this is being taken down at the same time. Hey, say it with me. Hyborian. Remember the Hyborian war map? We're talking Ofer. And you got Ofer right over here. You know, you got Africa here. You got South America. All this is South America. Land of no return. Thothamon spell barrier. Don't that kind of look like an ice wall? Uh-oh, boss. Maybe that ice wall has something to do with Thoth, huh? <laughs> you got the Amazon, the Black Kingdoms, you got Timbuktu over here, you got all this cushions over here. <laughs> Not over there. Over here. You got Egypt and Luxor and Kim and Shem, Argos, and then you got Ophir. And you got Pickland divided into 12 tribes. <laughs> you got Samaria. Remember this drop so. A lot's happening, but yeah, they got Ofer over here as well. You know what I mean? Just quick little thought. And I'll leave this link for, you know, just so you can start reconning. They say African presence in Hawaii, man. We're talking about indigenous copper colored cons already here with his family popping off. And I just want to look at these dates for the dismount, man, because we're going to have to take our time with this. African features, curly hair. <laughs> Exterminated by English settlers, pure blacks, black people themselves, Nagas themselves, an ethnological puzzle, ethnological puzzle. Many of the Tasmanians were exterminated. Aborigines, very dark, curly hair, exterminated. You're talking about the original Hawaiians, my naga. Hawa. Hawa. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. The basic strain of the original Hawaiians as seen in the color and face. So everybody noticed. I mean, you know, I got people, you know, I came across from Hawaii that always validate this information. You know, they got more information, you know, they got tribal information. I was behind the wall. One of the bros behind the wall is Hawaiian. He gave me a lot of information about this, this Naga kingdom that's already popping off. Kamehameha defeated 
Key Wallow. So they 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 had their own family war, right? Everywhere you go, you got a family war going on. Therefore, proceeding to battle against the chiefs in Maui, Lene and Malokai in 1810. And this is after King Kalanepo, Kalaniapo, and he named his older son successor, and it said Kamaha wanted the throne. And that's, you know, different uh, perspectives, you know, this war going on, but it was definitely a family war. Now, we do know that he united the tribes in 1810. King Kamehameha was the first to rule all islands. Six other kings and queens would succeed him to the throne, generally described as very dark and extremely handsome. Kamehameha, the great was a very capable ruler. He encouraged industry, promoted international trade, checked opposition, and suppressed crime. His drawback, his greatest drawback, however, turned out to be the faith he had in Europeans. So, yeah, this is 1810. The more and more wars popping off, Europeans are not just white people, right? <laughs> but they are whites. But this is the more and more war. And even he, they said, had faith in some of these tribes and ended up being his greatest drawback. Captain Cook, or Kurt, <laughs> was the first white man to reach Hawaii. Oh, Captain James Kirk came in the Enterprise with the Starfleet, right? <laughs> he found Hawaii, the first white man. Oh, Captain Kirk, oh, Captain Cook, Captain Hook. Found Peter Pan, huh? <laughs> he visited the islands January 1778. Traded with the natives and was well treated. After returning to Hawaii in November 1778, and remaining into the next year, he was killed when a quarrel arose between his traveling companions and the Hawaiians. So, like Estebanico, they weren't on no play play. They weren't on no play play. 1778. Look at the dates. Look at the dates. 1778. So we are at war. Kamehameha, Kamehameha like to come say in 1810, he united the tribes <laughs> and he's going to war. We're having our last stand in Hawaii. We're having our last stand in the Philippines. We're having our last stand everywhere, man. Mexico. The tribes of Israel are fighting everywhere simultaneously against the same invaders. Same corporations, the same treaties, the same hijacks. The same alchemical serpent. That brings everything to life, but also kills everything. Taking 380 degree circuits, 380 day circuits. <laughs> around their queue <laughs> setting it up while we have glaciers in america because of a little ice age it has everything to do with the epidemics emerging in america's upon european contact well that's crazy because it seems like that's what they're all facing european contact the first white man to reach hawaii 1778, 1810, Kamehameha got the six islands, right? And then it's wartime. And these 1800s are the last stand. 
Kamehameha III was very sensitive to the needs of the Hawaiian people while he represented the encroachments, while he represented the encroachments of foreign missionaries and traders. So he's letting them in now. The third is the king gradually came to realize the permanence of their presence, right? Sounds like Joseph Brandt, right? In the Tecumseh flow, it's all happening and therefore sought their guidance in improving the status of his people. His people, it was a takeover. It was the help of foreigners that the king established free schools through the island, introduced Hawaiian language newspapers and drafted the first Hawaiian constitution. So this is the takeover. His brother Lot, oh man, I'm out of here, man. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, man. We're talking about the tribes a lot. And you're saying that the takeover consisted of someone with the title Kamahamaha, the great, but his name is Lot. And he don't got nothing to do with Moab in there. But he's inviting his Europeans and making treaties and doing all this. And his name is Lot from 18th. Come on, man. Hawaiian ties with America, uh-oh, treaties, missionaries and businessmen becoming more and more prominent in Hawaiian affairs. So this one must have been super hijacked the fifth. <laughs> he died in 1872, succeeded by King Luanili, Luanalilo, known as the People's King, first elected king in Hawaiian history, and enjoy the love and respect of his people. His short reign of a little more than a year was marked by an effort to liberalize, liberalize the Constitution, attempts to curb the spread of leprosy, what? And the appointment of a new Board of Health and an unsuccessful plan to cede Pearl Harbor to the United States. And he died in 84, 1884. <laughs> we seeing the big picture, yeah? Fuego. 1884. So all this time that we're having Texas Indian Wars, we got a takeover going on in Hawaii. The Kama, the Kamahamayas, the, the Kamayamayas are still popping off, but kind of like the Montezumas, they start kind of getting watered down into this, you know, Europeanism of things, this treatyism of things, you know what I'm saying? And then here comes the Americans into the Philippines, right? So they got a hold of Hawaii, they got a hold of Mexico, they got a hold of America at this time, you know, American Revolution Wars, they got a hold of all these, they got a hold of the Swan Knights and the Barbars. Then they go to Ofer, <laughs> you know what I mean? Go out to the Philippines, Banana Wars, all these are the same. So they were in the Philippines, damn for like 30 some years, right? 30 something years of fighting these Nagas in the Philippines. Then they go into this Cold War, still still Philippines, Korean, Korean, Vietnam. And this is where we picking up right here. Our parents is picking up. Our parents are picking up right here, right? Born around right here, right? Our parents are born right around here, right? Grandparents are born way back here where it's all still happening. But their history has already been deleted. Their education has already been forfeited. And the Shikamagwa remember no more. And this is Preston Chan installment number 80, man. Oh, my bad. 
I guess I've been popping off too much, man. This is installment 90, man. We popping up. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we finished 90 complete installments of the Preston John investigation. We done walked around. <laughs> we done walked around harmonic cubes, man. We done talked Kamehameha, the Philippines. We done talked dog headed uh, St. Mercurius's. We done talked China. We done talked Antarctica, man, and Terra Fuego and Tar Sancta. We done talked, you know, King David, the king of the Indians, man. Emperor of the world. We done talked Dawi, who's fighting the whole time. These tribes are fighting all those that have consulted together with one consent and have made a covenant against you from all these houses. And we just finished talking a lot. Who's popping up in the Kamehameha line, man. That's crazy. <laughs> So the name of Israel is no longer in remembrance. They want us to be cut off from being a nation, the treasured ones, a wise people. But we, we remember. We hear Managa and we remember. Israel has returned. Afterwards shall the children of Israel return. Seek Hawa our power and David our Khan. And we shall come trembling to Hawa, not Muhammad, not Jesus, but to the Creator. In the end of days, man, we got the goodness, we got the cold. We got Dawi. We got one shepherd forever, man. And my servant David shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd, not two, three, or four. One, I said, one shepherd, David. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, not Morocco, not a Mexico not Atlantis, where your fathers dwell, and they shall dwell therein, they and their children and their children's children forever, and my servant David. David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. So your covenant of peace comes with David as your con for ever an everlasting covenant Kandawi. i will establish them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever with david as the con forever you can't mix this up you can't mess this up my naga my servant david shall be the king over there hosea 3 says seek hawa and kandawi jeremiah 30 said david whom i will raise up i will establish them and multiply them my dwelling place also shall be over them and i will be their power and they will be my people Amos 3, only family I've ever known, you only have I known, of all the families of the earth, my people and the nations shall know I am a one that sanctify Hashirah, Jacob, Israel.
when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. With my servant David as the Khan forever. And they gonna know, like you said, they gonna know I, I Hawa. I am Hawa. Because they're gonna see you being sanctified, my Nagas. And they're gonna know that Hawa's with you in your midst forever. Hey, do I die for surfing the wave with the cons this whole entire time, man? <laughs> We're talking Annie, yeah. We're talking the Preston right here in your face bone, man. <laughs> this is the Preston Hour. All praise, all creator, for the clarity that we can see clearly and continue to pop off, man, because. Preston John has idolatrous neighbors, and now we know who they are. The maker of the MS map that put this map in the British Museum in 1530 knew that it was a more and more war when they got here. Treaties on the headbone at the Comse, Dragon Canoe, and the Shikamagua. And Preston John is placed not far from Mexico. <laughs> This is the Presser Hour. All praise our creator. Allah. Wow.